Closed door attorney client session is now concluded and the board has returned to open session. In the closed session, we discuss possible settlement negotiations and or strategy related to litigation expenditures. Do I have a motion to close that meeting? Mrs. Andrews and Ms. Ayala have made a second. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. I'll now call the workshop, workshop to order at 2.30 p.m. Ms. Bellotta, please call the roll. District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. District 3, Karen Brill. <clears throat> District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marsha Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson, absent. We have quorum with six board members in attendance. Also joining us is Superintendent Michael Burke, Burke General Counsel Chantoy Bernard. Inspector General Teresa Michael and Board Clerk Tony Bellotta. Senior staff members will join us periodically as directed by the superintendent. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channels 234 and 235, UVerse channel 99, or by using the YouTube link on our webpage at palmbeachschools.org. In the event that the link is interrupted for technical reasons, please switch over to the TV channels. All board meetings are recorded in their entirety and posted on the district website within 24 hours. We also offer a listening only option which the public can access by calling 561-357-5900 or toll free at 1-866-930-7015. The meeting ID is 1-561-880-1124, pound sign. Would you all please stand for the pledge to be led by the superintendent. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Mr. Superintendent. Yes, well, thank you, Chairman Barbieri. Uh, we have a special encore presentation today of the fall instructional review. Uh, we had part one at a previous workshop there were some important slides and data we wanted to get to, make sure we gave it, uh, gave it a little extra time. So we're back today with uh, Deputy Superintendent Mr. Ed Tierney and our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Glenda Sheffield. Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chairwoman Mrs. Brill, School Board Members, Superintendent Burke, we're pleased today to have the opportunity to present part two of the instructional review. Always pleased to have a project to work on with my colleague, Dr. Glenda Sheffield, and with that, we'll start. Um, good afternoon. Um, just as we move into part two to be able to make the connection from part one um, to part two, as it's been a few weeks, is that as a reminder in part one where we looked in regards to all of our FSA data from last year, along with some of our K2 data. Um, not alone uh, did we just look at the data, but we also talked about how we're responding to the data. So for each of those content areas, we leaned in a little bit and just showed um, the board um, some snippets in regards to what some of those resources our frameworks would look like or is looking like as a district as we're working with our teachers, principals, um, and other staff. This particular slide, um, before we move on to talking around the progress that we've made with the scheduling pieces, this is just a reminder around some high levels around the support structures again. Um, as we talked around um, working with our principal supervisors um, where we are cre creating, analyzing, um, I should say first, analyzing data on a continuous basis, utilizing those data to create action plans and next steps. And most importantly, continuing to provide the professional learning community supports where needed and where teachers are wanting to participate um, there on their campuses and the coaching and mentoring from our program 
planners, from our um, resource teachers that we have here in the building, as we do have principals that are calling asking for ongoing support. And we just want to remind you as we shift over to the accelerated coursework piece, um, as those slides are coming up, around the work that we were able to do to continue to build on the instructional pedagogy by increasing um, many of our resources on our campuses, um, utilizing those ESSER dollars. And that was that last bullet there. I'm not going to read all of those pieces, um, but that's all inclusive to our student academic support plan. And then as we move over um, to the accelerated coursework, and this is the piece that we're getting ready to really dig um, into, is around the work that we've done last year. Um, you're gonna see the progress with it, with the scheduling, to where we are not just scheduling our students, we are being intentional and deliberate by those schedules. Meaning that our elementary um, principals and teachers are having some input and in working very closely with our middle school principals when our students are transitioning to the next level. And it's the same from middle to high. Um, so again, so for the sake of time, um, you have the slide here. This was just a high level in regards to what some of those support mechanism um, looks like as a district. At this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Turney where he's gonna literally show us the data. Thank you, Dr. Sheffield. So as you know, we've been working hard to get as many students as possible and enrolled in advanced coursework with the knowledge that those enrollment in those courses will open doors to them upon graduation and their future is not imposed based on our inefficient matriculation through the system on their behalf. So the, the biggest change we made in the mechanics of scheduling is each elementary principal purposely recommended the course load for their exiting fifth graders rather than the traditional teacher guidance counselor recommendation model to receiving teacher or guidance counselor AP. So they made personal recommendations on the coursework with the message and hope cast your net widely to get as many students enrolled as possible. We'll support them as they move through again so that they get into those courses that will really open doors to them upon graduation. So in front of you on the right half of that slide are the recommendations of exiting fifth graders, their current sixth graders, by subgroup. This is the first year we've done that, so we don't have historical data to provide context. I am gonna to try to provide context in another manner. So for instance, for black students, which is on the right-hand part of that slide, leftmost column, 57.1% of our exiting fifth graders who are black were recommended for advanced coursework. So for context, that same group scored 40% on high standard on ELA and 31.6% on high standard in math. So 57.1% recommended for, for advanced coursework, and if we average the two around 35% on high standard as an average. So I mentioned that to demonstrate to the board that we're casting our net widely on who gets enrolled in advanced coursework, and then we're reaching deep below proficient students, currently proficient students, to get them enrolled in those courses. That will be an accelerant to learning, and they will get proficient as they matriculate through. For Hispanic students, the next bar over, 63.4% of our exiting fifth grade Hispanic students were recommended for advanced coursework. That same group was proficient on ELA at 51.5% and math 45%, so significantly higher percent recommended into advanced coursework than pass the ELA, English, and math. White students, the same, significantly higher, 77.6% on ELA with an 85.3% recommendation towards advanced coursework. English language learners, 46.6% of our English language learners were recommended for advanced coursework in middle school. That group scored a 27% proficiency on ELA and a 26% proficiency on math. So once again, significantly higher percent of students recommended to advance coursework than scored proficient on the end of the year test. Free and reduced lunch, the same pattern, 61%, 60.8% recommended for advanced coursework with 46% proficient in ELA. And then we're very pleased with students with disabilities. 42.8% of the students recommended for advanced coursework in sixth grade. That group scored 26.5% on ELA and 25.7% on math. So work to be done on proficiency. However, almost doubled the number of students in advanced coursework than the proficient numbers. 
We're ready to go on to results. Mr. Board Chair, I just want to make sure that, that I, under, I explain that in a manner that people made sense so before I move on. Mrs. McQuinn and Mrs. Whitfield. I think I know the answer. And thank you for making this in everyday words. You know I love data, but I like everyday words too. Um, when you're saying proficient, so we're increasing our um, percentage of students moving into higher level classes. Correct. When I, so when I, I heard you say proficient twice, so we're also increasing the proficiency of those students moving into those classes? What I'm trying to demonstrate is with our, our percent of students who are proficient or th level three and above, we are recommending significantly higher percent into advanced course with the knowledge that that enrollment in advanced course is an accelerant to learning and those kids will catch up. Thank you. I knew I didn't quite have that. So I appreciate that. And so just a follow up, are we providing teachers we know that sometimes teachers are not as comfortable with students who have not traditionally been in the sure. higher level classes. Absolutely. Are we providing strategies for helping those students who might not have had the typical background? Yeah, the teacher professional development is a large part, and when I go through the outcomes, I think we'll kind of end on how are we, how are we addressing those types of questions, if that's okay. Mrs. Whitfield and Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. So. Um, I was doing some quick math while you were going, and I believe what you were saying is the green section and the blue section, you were adding those together, and you were saying those are the kids that were um, going to be put into advanced or advanced with support. You were grouping Correct. that all together in your numbers that you were doing. Um, and then you said we couldn't figure out where we were from last year because we didn't ever represent it this way, but right. you couldn't, in that box on the left where it says represent representativeness, that's of this year or is that last year? That's of this year and that's just the comparison. We've done this over years. This is the increase that I just talked about in enrollment for students in advanced course. On the left side is the comparison of enrollment advanced course with overall enrollment in the district and that's just to, to make sure that we are representing in advanced coursework the same, we're trying to get to the same percent for each subgroup than we are as the school. So if a school is 33% black, theoretically, well, advanced sure. coursework should be 33% black. So the left side is just to, to manage overall population versus advanced coursework population in a ratio. So couldn't you take the amount of students that were in last year in advanced coursework and just break it down by, um, okay. you know, break it down by uh, black, white, and Hispanic so we could know so we could see that there was actually an increase, so you could, you could know that increase? Because I, I feel like you can't see that here, and you, I know you said you couldn't go back, but wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be possible to do? Yes, we're coming up to outcomes, and the outcomes are who's sitting in those classes this year as compared to who's sitting in those classes last year, so we are gonna make a comparison to that. I'm just demonstrating to the board, or trying to, that the different system is the elementary principals made personal recommendations yeah, through like SIS that. that is now trackable, and before it was not. Okay, well, I'll, I won't take up time in a second, but I'll just put this out there. When you get to that point, um, can you talk about, you know, what happens when a student doesn't live up to no. the, uh, whenever you get to that point, I know you're coming to it, because it's something that people constantly ask me, and, I, and I'm always spouting your message, so I just want to give an opportunity for you to share it again. We're Thank at you. that point. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, Mr. Tierney, and just, I saw you uh, going to the schools, working with the counselors, helping them to get ready to put this in place, and I think this is great. And I think I asked this the last time we were here. I would like it to be drilled down deeper because I'd like to know what this looks like at each one of the schools uh, within the district as we look at the different uh, subgroups, and I'd like to see it by schools. That will tell me a better handle of what's happening at each school. But I know you went to every school that I walk with you on, and I know it's happening, but if we can de uh, delve down deeper, and maybe that'll be another workshop or something you'll give us at a later date, but that's what I'm looking for. We will touch on that this presentation, then could follow okay. up. So outcomes, so I, right now, up until now, we covered the recommendations, which is new. This is the outcomes, which is a comparison last year to this year. Complicated slide, that right third where it says enrollment rate, that's where we'll start. So you can see for black students in 2022, we had 
68% of our students in advanced coursework in middle school, which is relatively high. This year, based on this new process, we have 73%. So we are up 5% for black students in enrollment in advanced coursework in middle school. Enrollment in advanced coursework in middle school is actually high school work. Advanced coursework in high school is college work. So when we say advanced coursework in middle school, we're actually talking about high school classes. For Hispanic students, 67.4% last year, 74.3% this year. That's an increase of 4.9%. White is up point or 3.5%. If we look at English language learners, and I'm going to compliment the elementary principals and the middle school principals for its very successful handoff for this population. We saw an increase of 12.8% for ELL students' enrollment in advanced coursework last year to this year. Mrs. McQuinn. I know this is controversy. Is it at some point ever possible that we would say every subgroup will have a given percentage? So in other words, we can't dictate what the outcome will be in terms of a score on a test. But we could dictate that every school have a certain percentage at a, I'm, I'm going to say here, 83.5 percent um, enrollment rate for 2022 for white. Could we just say that um, every single subgroup would enroll at that rate regardless of, I, and I understand the criteria that we used, and the criteria that you used certainly have put more there. I, I realize that's a theoretical question, but I don't know how else we're ever going to catch up. I'll, I'll address it. So I, I get that question on occasion and, and regularly asked, why don't we just auto-enroll all students, a percent of students, into certain courses? And I think it's a fair question. I have talked to other people involved in scheduling smarter than I about the possibility of doing that. And those conversations, in my own personal belief, is we have to influence the hearts and minds of people scheduling these kids and the teachers teaching them because if we don't and we impose that through a machine, at some point it's going to level set. They're going to say, potentially shouldn't have been here anyway. So the, the work has been, Ms. Andrews referenced it, you know, visiting every school, talking about it at the PLAs, having it on agendas 17 or so times last year, is to really talk about the hearts and minds and the impact so that we are, we are encouraging them into those schedules and welcoming, those in, in welcoming them into the classrooms. Students with disabilities, so up 9.3%, so 54.6% of our st exceptional students in middle school are now in an advanced course. So now we're to high school outcomes. High school advanced coursework defined as college level work in content areas. We saw for black students an increase of 5.1%, Hispanic students increase of 3.6%, and then white up 5.6%. So we're seeing increases across the board. Those are statistically significant. To Ms. McQuinn, for your previous question, that left portion of the slide marries up percent of students overall versus percent in advanced coursework to try to regulate are we, are we getting the percents that statistically we should have. English language learners of 6.7% in college level work in high school. And then for our students with disabilities, we're up over 3, 3.1%. Curiosity, we deal with percents, but I just wondered if it came down to people's children, what, what, what do these percents translate into? And this is the numbers for the percents that we just went over of students who are in advanced coursework who probably otherwise would not had we not pushed. So those numbers, and I'll just be quiet for a second as you look at that. Mrs. Andrews. I love that, Mr. Tierney and uh, Dr. Sheffield. But if I'm traveling to a particular school, is there a mini version of this for that particular school? Is that something you're going to create so that I can pick it up and say, oh, wow, let me see. As I'm looking at the district level, I can see a specific school level of just this that we're talking about. And I, I meant to answer that after the last. What I have on the screen now is the Power BI the team made, which is really quite incredible. You can see on the, the blackened out portion, it says high school, and then 
on the left side, there's all the schools. So we can click on any school in the, any secondary school in the county, middle school or high school, we can look up any subgroup. We can back map the middle schools to the elementary recommendations to, to, so to both your questions, this one and the earlier one, we can, we can check very specifically for every school. And as this year's round of school visits, we were together on many last year, I'm kind of looking at what was your high standards, what did you recommend, and then did we really cast our net widely and giving as many students a chance as we can. All right, so we got, is that, Mr. Tierney, have you gone through your slides there? Through the slides, yes, sir. Okay. Well, I would like to compliment Mr. Tierney, Dr. Sheffield, and, and all the principals following their lead. Uh, Mr. Tierney's been on, been on a quest to expand opportunities for our students, and it's, it's working. It's paying dividends. We saw nearly 7,000 students are now taking advanced coursework that they may have otherwise not had the opportunity. So. Looks like Ms. McQuinn has a, a question down there. Well, I just want to piggyback on that because okay. I think it was about a year ago, and it happens to be William T. Dwyer High School, that made such significant gains in, in particular, um, black students' success in yep. advanced placement classes. And Mr. Tierney went in and worked with a very receptive, receptive principal about come on, let's put the kids in these classes. Why aren't they there? And actually, they were looking at it from a money perspective, and there you go. The kids went in, and the teachers did a great job of teaching them and significantly increased their passing rates. So thank you for that, and I know that you're replicating that across the district. Appreciate the kind words, but that the passing rate, suspension rate, attendance rate, all good things come from scheduling students based on potential. Yeah. This is Whitfield. Did I miss the answer to my question? Support. Just support. That's the no. answer. That, that's your question. Yeah. So yeah. Just just about like what do you do when someone's not making it? Because I, I feel like one of the issues that I've been coming across when I've talked about this, I think it's wonderful. First of all, I'm thrilled that we're doing this. But some people, um, even students, I had a student at Saint Lucia's tell me that you know I have kids in the classes with me that, that shouldn't be in there. And no. so I'm trying to respond to yeah. them in a way that you know everyone in the community can understand why sure. we're doing this and hopefully um, they'll believe in what we're doing going forward. Sure, so when I get students don't belong there and I hear that, you know, I've heard that for years, I, my response is we've always scheduled students wrong but we've scheduled them down, traditionally the same students over and over. So if we're gonna make an error I would just soon make the error up knowing that we can always slide back if we need to rather than schedule down because there's a point where you just can't catch up. You're just not going to go from one to the next. So my response when someone says you made a mistake, we, we've been making thousands of mistakes every year, I would rather err up. So the biggest thing is to try to normalize the enrollment and advanced coursework. So it is not an exception where someone might need a tutor because you really don't belong in here but we're going to try to help. So we have AMP in every elementary school this year for the first time ever. So every single one to start that process earlier. And then the conversation and knowledge that we've kind of referenced on, get them enrolled in advanced coursework to normalize that the best possible way we can. The regional office has facilitated a lot of meetings from principal to principal, elementary to middle, middle to high school. These are the skills we're looking at to succeed in these classes. This is what we're looking for, the threshold to be enrolled. So someone who's gonna come work hard, even a level two, level one, enroll them, we'll handle that and support. And then some teacher to teacher, these are the skills we're looking for. So throughout the system, we have been supporting to an extent. For as far as coming out, what I always said, and I, I, I advise people, if you're saying you can't do a course, a student comes and says it's too much, two weeks of maximum effort and then we'll look. So you go to every class, you study for every test or quiz, you hand in every assignment, and if after two weeks of maximum effort, you're telling me you can't, and the teacher says this might not be it, then by all means we'll move you. If you miss a class, miss an assignment, you didn't do maximum effort, therefore we really can't gauge whether or not you're enrolled. So that's, that's how I recommend people doing that. Now we do have a, we do have a, a project this year that Mr. Burke and I speak about weekly that, that we're kind of pushing on is for examining extended opportunities to learn within the district. So what is our current state and what is our desired state? So our current state we're collecting right now for every school, how are you extending opportunities to learn? So for elementary school, in aftercare, is there a homework time? And be honest, right, the pandemic 
harmed staffing, which, which minimized abilities to offer some. So we used to have it, but now we really don't check it. So we're right now taking an honest assessment where we are on our current state for advanced core, or for extending opportunities for learn for elementary, middle, and high school. And then our desired state, what do we want? We want homework, we want it checked. Dr. Sheffield and I will work on getting round table discussions and training for the teachers that we're asking to teach these classes, because understand more teachers more kids enrolled in classes means more teachers teaching it traditionally have not, and anyone will tell you it takes three years really to figure it out. So we're working together to provide supports on that in order to help the teachers, help the students to recognize there's more we can do outside of what we're doing. We've met, met with Early Learning Coalition a couple times. We've talked about MOUs with Boys and Girls Clubs. So all those things to expand how we help. Because initially when we started, my admittedly shallow thinking was for the kids that were behind you know, conversations with the superintendent and him kind of pushing, thinking the students that were enrolling here maybe that otherwise wouldn't have been need that extra support and the students who are pursuing admission to the most prestigious colleges and universities in the state and the country probably need some extra support as well because they're competing with brilliant kids. So we're really looking system-wide on how we can expand that. And I just have to add to it, um, Mr. Attorney, because um, as we talk about accelerating our students and getting, we have more in the advanced coursework, is one piece that we are working on and getting everyone to understand. Um, the interventions um, and the, the interventions does not leave our students when they go into an accelerated coursework. They should be receiving those interventions, um, differentiating the instructions and so forth. Those kinds of um, resources and support mechanisms that we would use for our students that may have not been exposed to the advanced coursework, we should be seeing those same kinds of support services in our accelerated coursework, our advanced coursework, or what have you. And part of that, what we're doing is that we're spending time next month in November really working with our principals around the MTSS, the school-based team piece, to where we're really looking at those interventions and talking about what that looks like, not just for our students with disability, for our ELL students at the same time. And it should transform from, again, those students that may, from their comprehensive classroom to the, those that are participating in the advanced coursework. Good point. Mrs. Andrews, then Vice Chairwoman Brill. I think you all did a great job in explaining that because that was gonna be my question as to what were the supplemental pieces yeah. that you had in place for those who actually tried their best or in there struggling and the teachers are doing everything that they can, but they may need additional time, additional material, additional support. So it sounds like you're thinking about how that looks and how we can expand that, which may mean some extra time for the children, extra support mechanisms with the curriculum, maybe some more tutorial support. You know, we have the paper, but just just trying to see before they get discouraged to say they can't do it. Yes, ma'am. Making it exciting for them to let you know you can do it. Let me show you some things that can help you feel Absolutely. good about it. So you answer that well. Thank you. Vice Chairwoman Rook. Thank you. And you answered one of my comment, my questions about the supports. But, you know, we all know that all students learn differently. And I'm just very excited to see the number of special of uh, the yeah. students with disabilities that are participating in the higher level courses because a lot of those students and I've seen this um, from experience may not be succeeding in the lower level but in the higher level and in the advanced they're going to walk away with more knowledge Absolutely. than you know they may not get it all but they're going to be at a higher functioning level than what they would have been in the lower level. So I just think it's great that, that we're doing that. And I guess that's the answer for parents that don't understand why some are not succeeding at the same level. You know, the supports are there, but these students are going to take away more at the end of the day. So thank you. Absolutely. Mrs. Andrews. In my last comment, when uh, we were together, Mr. Tierney, I never saw a principal that wasn't eager to do this. And we went to a lot of schools. And they were eager to look at how they could really adjust their schedules to do the things that you're talking about on here. So you're to be commended that that was your objective. You worked with them. You helped them with the support mechanism to do this stuff. But I saw the principals yeah. being very eager to get it done. And I was sitting there watching the whole process. And so it was about you and your encouragement to we're not leaving children behind. We're going to give them all the opportunity to get to these levels. So. Commence Thank you, Ms. You. Andrews. Mm -hmm. and, and as difficult as last year was, every single principal leaned in on that, and I appreciate them being willing to do that. 
Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Mr. Tierney and Dr. Sheffield. Yes, thank you very much. It is exciting work. And you know, it, it takes discipline and a systematic approach, and Mr. Tierney has been sure to provide that. So. All right, our next workshop that takes us to policy 2.3817, school campus and district facility security. This is a new policy. Uh, Chief Sarah Mooney and Deputy Chief Vanessa Snow are going to take us through it. by Ms. Yolanda Morgan, our attorney extraordinaire. Yes, I have the A team up here supporting me. I appreciate it. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Barbieri, Ms. Brill, and the rest of the, uh, the board. Uh, this, more, or this afternoon, we're going to present our first uh, presentation of our most recent school board policy. It's a brand new one on school campus and district facility security. Um, we found that a lot of the information that's going to be in this came out of the need to outline some of the programs that we've been implementing over the past several months to give some more direct guidance on some of the things that we have initiated but have hidden in different um, trainings on e-learning and bulletins and that kind of thing just to clarify what we're doing security-wise um, through, through the uh, police department and facilities for that matter. Uh, this new policy basically is geared towards um, explaining, not the difference, but, but explaining the, the function behind some of the state statutes that we have mandatorily, um, national so school security best practices, which are not necessarily mandates, but those are things that the board has um, kind of directed us that, that why don't we have this as a, as a mandate within the district um, to give us some guidance on things that they would like to implement that aren't necessarily state mandated, but our best practices and everybody thinks that they should be state mandated, so why aren't they in a policy somewhere? Uh, and it also demonstrates the fact that the school board has given us the direction to take that extra step to enhance the security that, that we will have on the campuses in the district. The scope of this policy is actually fairly small. We have really addressed only three main issues in this initial policy. Um, moving forward, I think there's going to be a lot of things that will need to be added to this policy to give specific guidance, again, on mandates versus best practices as the district gives us guidance on what they would like to see in a policy to ensure that we are following um, your direction, not just the state's direction, but, but what we can do over and beyond the state's direction locally. So the three topics that are covered in the policy are the, the crisis alert panic buttons, that's Centegix that we just recently got. Um, basically, we didn't name it as Centegix. It, the, the Alyssa's law mandates that we have a mobile panic solution. This was implemented actually last year, 2021. It was mandated. We had Safer Watch at the time. We upgraded over the summer. Uh, as you know, that huge project with the Centegix, the buttons, the lights, the whistles, everything going off, but we didn't really have it put into a policy somewhere so everybody knows exactly how they're supposed to use it. So we did a lot of training. We've got a lot of bulletins out on them. There's a ton of information on the website um, and the hub, but we haven't put, in, put, put it into to board uh, policy yet. So this is, this is the, one of the topics that we felt that we really needed to address so that we could get some clarification to the people that are using this system. Um, as we say, between the difference between mandates and best practices, believe it or not, the locked gates and locked doors on the campuses is a best practice. It's not a mandate by the state. However, there's been a lot of discussion where people in the district think it is a mandate. We got direction from you all to kind of address policy so that it is. It's, it's over and beyond. We're going one step further than what the state's telling us we have to do. So we have some guidance on that in this policy. Um, another thing that we thought that was important to make sure that the campus uh, or people within the district are aware of is the Fortify Florida app. That is a mandate by the state and there's very specific guidelines on how we have to advertise that and have that available. So we felt it was important to include that in this policy to make sure that when, when this policy is implemented that the site security on each of the campuses and or even on the site facilities um, throughout the district that the people that are running those locations are aware of what we have to do in order to advertise the Fortify Florida app. So the crisis alert procedures, um, there's really, there's two 
to try to, to try to explain it, there's two different alerts that we can use. There's what's called a staff alert, and then there is a lockdown alert. This policy outlines the difference between a staff alert and who's going to respond to that, in addition to what a lockdown alert is and who's going to respond to that. So the three-button push on those Centegics basically is going to notify people on the campus that there's an incident on the campus, not necessarily an emergency, that there needs to be some extra bodies to go address the situation. So the policy will outline who responds to that, um, who will deactivate that alert once the response is been completed, um, in addition to kind of saying, designating certain people who will be on the campus that would fit the bill of site responders when there is an alert initiated. Uh, the lockdown position, is a, that's a whole different story. The only people we want to respond to a lockdown would be the law enforcement officers on the campus and or responding first responders from outside of the campus. So that's explained in the, in the policy also. Uh, as far as after school coverage on the alerts, we, we kind of outlined the idea of having limited staff alerts, that non-emergency response hours. It's not only in the school campuses, but it would be at the, the off-site facilities. The only reason that we say we want to limit the staff alerts is because you don't necessarily have the same personnel on the campus or on that site during the after-hours events. So you're not going to necessarily have that team of people responding to that non-emergency situation after hours. So that in each of the campuses, you could use it, and technically speaking, the people that are, are the site responders during the day have the ability to deactivate the alarms on their phones and whatnot, but they're not necessarily physically able to respond to that alert request. So that's why we built that into the policy, that that would be a limited use function there. Um, lockdown alerts, however, anytime. If you're near the campus and your Centegics button can, can hit the Wi-Fi, hit the receivers, that law enforcement's going to be called. So that's outlined in the policy also. Uh, in regard to using the Centegics platform, we, again, we didn't use Centegics in the, in the policy itself. It's a hard panic solution. It's a, it's a process. It's not necessarily a product, so that's why it's, it's not referred to as a Centegics in, in the policy. Um, but we require annual refresher training for people and anybody that's already got the badge. We're already seeing the benefits of revisiting the training with some people. So that's built into the policy that we want to ensure that everybody takes a look at, at how to use that system annually so that, so that we can become very good at using it and not overusing it or underusing it. Um, enforcement piece, there's two pieces to that. Um, when you say enforcement, we want to be able to have an ability to ensure that the employees safeguard their badge, that they don't just throw it on a table and have some kid grab it and then go test it throughout the campus. So there's a little piece on the enforcement there that's included in the policy um, in regard to having the, the staff members be responsible for maintaining custody of that badge. Uh, and then in addition to that, there's an enforcement piece that's actually criminal that's outlined in the policy very briefly that the willful misuse of the Centegics platform or the hard panic solution could potentially lead to prosecution if it's kind of like the abuse of a 911 system or 911 call. So that's also included in the policy. The second piece after the uh, Alyssa's alert mandate is the best practice locked gates and doors. So limited access points to the campuses we feel is very important. That is a practice. Um, Mr. Sanchez and his team have done a phenomenal job getting fencing on these campuses, internal, external perimeters and whatnot. There's tons of gates on the campuses. There's been a lot of discussion on do we have to keep them locked? Can we keep this open? How about just for this amount of time? Um, the, the, the policy outlines that all the gates on the campuses during instructional time will be locked except for the main entry gate that leads to where your single point of entry is. So if you drive by a campus that appears to have a wide open front gate, it's because people need to be able to get into the visitor parking lot and get to the front front gate. So that's the only gate on the campus that should ever be left unattended and, and or unlocked. Um, and now when I say unattended though, there's, there's, a, there's a point in the policy that kind of points to the single point of entries. So the single point of entry is where that one gate should be so that the person that would be in the front office and or parking lot monitor or somebody that's monitoring the guard shacks that, that are forthcoming would be that, that person that kind of intervenes as they come in. It's not unattended. We would like to have, have the gate, un or gate attended, 
but the idea is kind of that single point when somebody comes on the campus where it's open, you have to have somebody that's available to be able to see that that person's coming and to vet them as they come in or identify them as a threat. Um, the classroom doors, that was another issue that came up. Um, best practices, you lock the doors during class. It's not a state mandate. A lot of people think that it is. It is not. However, there's been a ton of feedback from not only you um, on, the, on the dais today, um, but the people in the field, the, the teachers, there's, there's you know, admin that say we, you know, some people think we have to lock the doors, some people think we don't. There's some hesitation on some you know, the excuses as to why there might be a time that we need to keep them unlocked. Um, this kind of outlines that now the, the district says you will lock the doors during instructional periods of time. And that little enforcement piece is also included in there that, that there has to be some ramification. We don't determine what that is. That would be just based on, on whatever is an appropriate <laughs> disciplinary measure if you consistently do not lock your doors. Because that, that's been proven to be a best practice nationwide. The first thing that would, would prevent somebody from entering a room is having the door locked. So that's a mandate that, that has been established in this policy. Uh, finally, the promotion of Fortify Florida. There's just a couple specific things that you have to do in regard to advertising that. Uh, as we were looking through uh, some of the, the, the FSATs and actually doing visits to the campuses, uh, most of the physical posting of the Fortify Florida information is good but there's certain ramifications if you do not post it on when you put out electronic notifications and newsletters and that type of thing, that needs to be tightened up a little bit so that's specified in, in, the, in the policy also, just so that people know exactly what they have to do per the state. So the Fortify Florida is actually a mandate, not just a best practice. So we outlined the policy for that, or procedure for that. And that was pretty much the, uh, the extent of what we have come up with so far. Like I said, is I think that um, I've always said that the campus security is going to be an ongoing issue. It's going to be an ongoing project. It's never going to be done. So I see this policy growing in the future as we, as we zero in on specific things that, that people want to make sure everybody knows has to be done or not done. Uh, but as of right now, this is our, kind of our first bite at it. So open for discussion if anybody's got any questions on, so on what let me, we presented. Let me go first because I know Ms. Brill wants to speak, and I'll call on her second. Um, I've spent a lot of time on this over the last couple of days. In fact, this morning I was interviewed by WPTV on this various, <clears throat> on this various policy, this very policy. So I want to go over the comments I have, and then my colleagues can chime in on anything they think differently. But I want to go through them first. So let's go to uh, line 14. Uh, you have you have on line 14. You talk about a school district identification badge, and then you talk about the panic alarm badge, which is fine. But in definitions, you have badge hard panic alarm. So I think that that definition should say it should be the definition of a hard panic alarm badge, which is a device that connects employees with identified staff and 9-11 centers when activated rather than when appropriate, right? Because it's only connecting when it's activated. So some employees have asked if they're being, you know, uh, watched all day long because they have this badge on. So it, it's only when they're activated that they actually connect. Um, when you look at line 23, um, 22 and 23, it talks about the badge manager, and that's fine. It's got a definition in the first sentence, but then it says they have the ability to run reports and check the health of badges. They are not considered to be site responders. That's fine, except that, should, that first sentence, they have the ability to run reports, should be under the role of badge managers because you have a whole other section on the roles of these different people. So that sentence, they have the ability to run reports and check the health of badges, should be under role instead of under, under, under the definitions. On line 44, you say that site responders do not have responsibilities to initiate, manage, and close alert act activations. Of course they do. They are district employees, and they certainly have the authority to initiate a, a lockdown in the school. So that paragraph needs to be qualified. It says, I understand that you were talking about site responders don't normally uh, you know, have any responsibilities to supervise the initiation, manage, and close alert activation, but they certainly have the right to initiate an, act, an alert activation, that paragraph would seem to say they don't have any responsibility to do that. So that's got to be clarified to make sure that it, it says that they do. Um, there's just a typo on line 47. It says the school board is, it, are implementing, it, the school board is one entity, so it should say is implementing. Um, my biggest issue is under lines uh, 50, 50, 63 through 66. 
Before we get to that, though, when we get to line 57, it says this activation may be initi initiated when a staff member, it should say district employee, because I could be on the campus, any board member could be on the campus, people that are working on the air conditioning system could be on the campus, they are not staff members and they should be able to issue a staff alert if they believe it's necessary to do that. So that should be changed from staff and member to district employee. My biggest issue, as I said, is on line 63 through 66. <clears throat> I don't like the way it's worded with respect to, you know, the, it gives examples. It says, this activation is initiated for a site lockdown, i.e. code red, an incident such as active shooter, visible weapon, violent offender on campus. I think that whole section should be replaced with this. This activation, lockdown, this activation for a site lockdown, a code red shall be, initiate, shall be initiated by a district employee when the employee becomes aware of or sees an active shooter, a violent offender, or an imminent threat on district property. Because having the words visible weapon, I mean, we could have a kid with a, a gun, I mean, a knife in his backpack. We're certainly not going to do a code, code, a, a code, a red code, a code red if, if, if the knife is being taken out of the, by the school police or somebody else, the, the teacher knows it's in there and says, Get, give me that knife. Uh, we don't do a code red for that. So it should be an imminent threat because you have a weapon that you see that doesn't require a code red, and then you have a guy that's crossing over the courtyard that's got an AK-47. He's not, at that point, an active shooter or violent offender, but certainly he's an imminent threat. So that should be specified that, that employees are required to push that button when they see an active shooter, a violent offender, or an imminent threat on district property. Under school ancillary, uh, line 74, school ancillary site administrator. I don't know what a school or slash ancillary site administrator is. It's not defined anywhere. Why is it those words needed, school ancillary? Shouldn't it just say site administrator? Um, is there, I, I think it was what you're trying to say is you have a site administrator on a school and you also have a site administrator somewhere else on other district property, but whether they're in a school or somewhere else, they're still site administrators. So I don't think there should have that qualification in front of site administrator. On line 95, um, it says that sites shall follow their existing process in place for incidents or medical emergencies outside of regular school hours. This covers all district properties, so why is it limited to school hours? It should be whenever there's a situation that requires um, staff alerts. So I, I get what you said earlier, but I, I think we just need to qualify that it's not just during school hours. If you're on district property somewhere and there's staff working, um, after 2.30 at an elementary school, everybody goes home, but at other places in the district, they may be working until 5 o'clock. So I think that needs to be clarified that it's not just limited to school hours. Um, and on line 97, I think after the word school, you need to insert the words or other district facility. Let's get to the door situation on line 125. It starts on line 25. I don't like the way it's worded because you, Chief, told me that one of the issues you have with your officers checking doors is that you find a door that's unlocked and there's no repercussions. You know, you tell the teacher, you tell the principal, and the teacher may get a slap on the wrist, but the next thing you know, you go back and the door's open again. And all of us are constantly getting emails from, from teachers and other people in the district saying that, you know, there's a teacher that's leaving the door unlocked, that she doesn't want to, he or she doesn't want to lock it because they don't want to get out of their seat to open the door. So I suggest that number three be changed to read as follows. All classroom doors leading to corridors or outside, which means that if it goes into a hallway, I guess what you mean by corridor, it's a hallway inside the school. All classroom doors leading to corridors or outside must remain closed and locked during class. It will not be left propped or standing open except during class change. And then add this, add this to the rest of it. Failure to lock a classroom door which leads to a corridor or outside when students are inside the classroom or the manipulation of doors or locks to prevent the locks from securely engaging is strictly prohibited, comma, is a serious violation of this policy, comma, and will result in disciplinary action up to and including termination. The up to and including termination was actually added by the general counsel. Uh, she thought that those words should be included. I want to make sure, and I'm sure my colleagues want to make sure that everybody in, the, in the, this district understands that you leave, a locked door, you leave a door open because you're too lazy to lock it, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. You can be terminated for that. 
Because if we have a door that's left open and somebody gets in and kills a kid, they're going to say, well, the teacher did it several times and nobody ever did anything about it. We need to make sure that everybody in this district understands that there are serious consequences to leaving a door unlocked when there's children on the other side of that door. And that's basically all I have. So, Ms. 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 Brill, you were next. Thank you. I'm going to be a lot easier. Uh, and so I just say I completely agree with, with Chairman Barbieri's comments. Um, I'm going to share information that I found, and I do have a question. So I focused on Safer Watch versus Fortify Florida, and I know that Fortify Florida is in Florida Statute 943.1082, the School Safety Awareness Program. But I did a little research at first before I realized that it was state statute. Um, because the Safer Watch, although it has the emergency panic buttons, has the tipster, and the tipster is basically what Fortify is. So I dug a little deeper and discovered that Fortify was created by, the, by Attorney General Pam Bondi's office, along with the Florida Department of Education, where Safer Watch um, was created by Broward Sheriff's, Sheriff's office and is used outside of Florida, where Fortify is used inside of Florida. Interestingly, when I researched the apps, um, th there are 35 ratings for Fortify Florida. They're rated 2.5, and Safer Watch is rated 98. I'm sorry, had 98 ratings and is rated 4.5. So I found that kind of interesting that Safer Watch is much higher rated. But Mr. Barbieri brought up a question which ties in with my question. I know we have to use Fortify. I know we need to have people put it on their phones. The question is, who houses the data? And basically, the question that Mr. Bar Barbieri raised is the question I think I anticipate hearing from employees, and that is, are the employees being watched all day when they have to put a, an app that the, the Department of Education owns? Well, I don't know if they own it. So the question is, who owns the app, if you know? And we're going to have to find a way with communication to deal with that because I would anticipate people being worried about being watched by the Attorney General and the Department of Education. So do you know who owns it? That would be who you just said. Um, we don't own it. It is, it is a state program that was developed through Ashley Moody in her office, and, and it is a state-owned site or app. So just as a follow-up, I think we're going to need to anticipate, um, Mr. Superintendent, that there might be some pushback from employees, and we're going to have to make sure that everybody understands that this is a state requirement, that we have to have it on all our phones. Um, we don't? Okay. For clarification, um, it is required to be on all student-facing devices, so it is not required, Fortify is not required to be on employee devices. So that means it'll be on all of our district um, computers as a shortcut on your desktop, and it is already installed on all student-issued devices. So any student-issued mobile device, Correct. which I guess is still going to be the same question at the end of the day, um, is just we should be prepared because people are afraid of data sharing right now. We heard that with, with Activate. Um, you know, um, so I think we need to just be cognizant that that's going to come up. And I, and I do hope that Fortify gets higher ratings in the future. <laughs> thank you. Mrs. Whitfield. I just, um, thank you. I just wanted to jump in on the locked doors on campuses. I have had the same experience um, as many of you walking around campuses and seeing the doors unlocked. And I think um, one of the things that holds everyone back is really when you're a principal, you don't want your teachers to hate you, and you're constantly going into their classrooms, and every time you go in, you see if their door's unlocked. It's like an annoying thing to have to say. So I love that we put it more firmly in this policy and kind of put that onus on us and say, so the principals can say, you know, gosh, that board, <laughs> they're making, they really think that we need to do this, and that's fine. Um, but I, it is something that kind of bothers me every time I walk around a campus, and I see doors open because I know I know it it is not a good practice and you know I always ask the principal about it and then you know they're like oh yes I'm going to check with them on that um, but it really it's been many years and this has to stop we have to have these doors locked um, it just it makes perfect sense to me so I love that you brought that up and I love your firmer language and I'd really support changing it within the policy thank Mrs. you Mrs. Andrews 
Thank you, and I thank the chief uh, for bringing this first read for everyone. I really do believe that you're doing a great job. I love that, Mr. Barbier, as you tighten, tighten this up a bit. Uh, I'm down in uh, line 70 about only uh, law enforcement will respond to lockdown alerts. Can you help me understand how that works a bit? You know, I know that um, you have a principal, a school police officer, you have a whole lot of people, the crisis team. I just want to make sure that everybody's clear as to what happens uh, when there is a, a lockdown alert. Okay. So the, it's the difference between a lockdown and a lockout or a code yellow. So on a lockdown, that's where you do have that imminent threat or potential for that. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want teachers running towards an armed subject mm -hmm. unless they're trained to be able to do that. So this, the, the person that you have trained on campus right now are sworn law enforcement officers to go to that threat. Mm -hmm. So that would be the responses there. And you have law enforcement on the way, backup. Um, we want the people that, that have the training to be the ones that are responding. So that's, that's what that's directed towards. Thank you, and I like that. And I also want to make sure that as we work through this policy and we're talking about these issues every day as a time that we're still outlining to make sure we get it as tight as we can, how are we going to make sure that as we're looking at these pieces today, even though it's not finalized by the board, that others will know that these are some things that we're really uh, concerned about as we walk through this piece today that we're walking through? How, how, how can we? Because every day is a day and a minute that anything can happen. And we heard some things today as we talked about locked doors and, and how we're trying to keep everybody safe. And I know it takes a while for the policy to actually be uh, approved. What are we doing before the, uh, the final approval to make sure that anything that we're talking about today, people are listening, the schools are listening to know that we're refining and modifying, but guess what, we want you to be on alert because these are things that we're looking at. So what kind of process will we have? It's kind of different with this that we're talking about today because we're so worried about making sure that everybody's safe. I, I, would, I would say that we are implementing these items already. Um, the, the best practices are being preached within the schools. Uh, it, it's just a matter of, of putting them in the policy to memorialize them so that there's no question whatsoever that in those informal discussions or even formal discussions and practices on the campus daily, we are implementing these things already. Um, but again, this is just reinforcement of what we've already started. So it's, it's a day, every day, every day there, there's room for improvement. But, but every day we're going to watch and we're going to try to make that improvement. So as we're talking about this today mm -hmm. and, and tightening up based on some of the things we heard up here, that's an ongoing thing, even though we may not have completed this policy for the next few weeks. Everybody know that this is really it when we talk about it up here as a board. This is what we want to see because we see this is great and we're just tightening it up. So I think we're safe, but if we can make it even much more uh, concrete, as we talk about these things, this is great. Thank you. Mr. Superintendent, um, I, I, I guess based on the discussion that we have here that it probably would be important that the staff members and the, the school site administrators are notified that the board is serious about this. And although we under, understand that they've been making sure their doors are locked, that they understand that there's, this is coming down and there will be disciplinary action so they can start warning their teachers that they find unlocked doors that, you know, I found unlocked door today, but I'm telling you, after this board policy is in place, uh, the board has indicated this is going to be serious ramifications. Uh, yes, sir. I mean, we've, we've issued a bulletin that speaks to locked doors. Uh, we implemented the Syntegics hard panic button solution faster than we could get a policy adopted. We did that <laughs> over the summer. Uh, so we are full speed ahead. Uh, I think Chief Mooney explained it very well, that this, this policy is coming behind to memorialize and galvanize the best practices that we already expect of our schools. I want to th thank you, Chief Mooney and Ms. Snow, for Deputy Chief Snow, <clears throat> for putting this together. It's been a long time coming. and. And I appreciate the, you know, the time you spent with, both of you spent with me to discuss these issues. And, and, I'm, you know, and I'm just happy we finally got this policy out there so that we can make sure that, um, you know, I've told, we've all told our constituents that their children are safe in our schools, and they are. Um, this just makes sure that there's no second guessing that. And we have absolute understanding that they are safe everywhere in the district. So thank you. Mrs. Andrews. 
And I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Sanchez uh, from the operations group because it takes all of us to keep our children safe. When we talk facilities, when we talk this piece here, all of these pieces come together. And I've been watching the, the fence, the coverings and everything and the locking and all the people that are continually working to keep our schools safe. Uh, it's an ongoing thing that you're doing a great job at. So this is great to see this today. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, ladies. Yes, thank you. Uh, we'll take all the feedback and bring that back uh, for development. All right, that takes us to our third workshop, Policy 2.40, Field Trips. We're going to welcome back Dr. Glenda Sheffield, Chief Academic Officer. Deputy Counsel, Mr. Eric Bell, welcome. Okay, good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon again. We are here for um, our policy workshop on policy 2.40, which is on field trips. So the policy that we are bringing forth um, as it pertains to our field trip policy here as a district, as you can see here around the bulleted items, first and foremost is to update some language within our policy around some structure that we wanted here as district leadership. Most importantly, I do want to emphasize this second bullet here that ties into um, a state rule around some of our most recent legislative updates. And I'm going to actually just talk as it pertains to the added required, required information that we needed to make certain inclusive within our field trip um, packets and our field trips forms per se. When we look at that particular policy and what legislation is saying that what we need to make certain within our field trips to where all students being inclusive of all students, that we needed to make certain that we were very clear to our parents that the nature and the purpose of the field trips, we also need to make certain that we were specifying the dates, time, field trips, specific location, exactly where these students were going on the designated field trip and most importantly, how they were getting there. Um, private transportation, um, charter buses, you know, our school-based buses, or what have you. And then, of course, what kind of supervisions were being provided to the students while they were participating in a district field trip. This last um, bullet here that I'm really going to talk about, which was what we really needed to work together with as a team, and I do want to thank um, Mr. Bell here um, from Council's office, was around making certain that we were specific as it pertains to the room assignments um, for any kind of overnight field trip. What were the lodging? Um, what was that going to look like for our parents? And that our parents were aware that if there were some modifications that needed to be, um, that needed to be made for any kind of overnight field trips. So with that being said, as it pertains to the lodging for any kind of overnight field trip, what we needed to do um, in working together here as a team, we found it necessary that we create a separate field trip forms. So you would notice that we're attached to your documents there that you have two separate field trip forms. You have a field trip form that is entitled, um, I think it's called single day. Also, it's called a multi-day um, field trip form. form. The multi-day field trip form is actually a brand new field trip form, um, form number 2674. This is the form that we would use for any overnight field trip. And it was important to create this particular um, form to where we are making certain that we are, we would notify parents that if it was in ever an event of a rare event of a room assignments that were you know, not being separated are by the biological sex, excuse me, the biological sex at birth, that it was being notified there on the form, and that parents will have an opportunity 
um, to make some decisions as it pertains and provide feedback to their child participating in the field trip and the kind of accommodations are the expectations of the parent. And that was really and truly the major change of what we needed to bring to this particular policy with an understanding in creating this policy and most importantly, the form around the multi-day field trip that it was important for us to keep in mind that whatever we did, we needed to make certain that we were respecting and respecting the privacy of the student. So as we came together and we were having conversation, we were, was very delicate at the same time in trying to make certain that we were being inclusive, that we were being inclusive of all students. How do we protect the privacy of our students? Vice Chairwoman Brill. I mean, I just want to make sure you're done with their presentation before I ask the question. Yes. Oh, okay. So if you could pull up, please, the uh, multi-day um, field trip permission release. And I had a lengthy conversation um, with general counsel last night, and I just wanted to just point out, and maybe you can read the language that would be in there, but I'll wait till you pull it up so I'll that everyone, right or if board members want to pull it up. I can direct you to where the, pro the question is. It's a multi-day or single? Which one it's the multi-day. I said that. <clears throat> well, I can tell you, because you're probably going to want to see it. So when I saw the permission slip um, where it has drivers, adult, or student, this is down one, two, three, four, five, six lines. It says lodging refer to policy 2.40. Yes. Um, that immediately I said to, to general counsel, you don't expect parents to read a policy, do you? And she said no, that there will be a drop down and there's some language, some standard language that, you know, I would like to know what the language is because looking at this form, it looks like the parent is expected to read a policy and it doesn't, I'm really just not clear on what this form is going to say. Well, right now, um, attorney, do you, you want to yeah, go ahead? You, okay. you mind if I field that one? Um, so th that top part of the, the form uh, where the lodging uh, portion is, that is expected to be filled out by the, the, the field trip coordinator, uh, not the parent. So the parent is not expected to know what's in the policy. Um, when we were reviewing this, um, we do think maybe a drop down is a little bit more appropriate. Um, and the language that would go in there would be uh, tracked from this new board rule to tell the parent whether or not uh, overnight lodging will include accommodations um, that are not separated by biological sex at birth, which is what the rule says. So that, that is what's anticipated to go in that portion of the form. Thank you, and I realize that we're not approving this, but I think if you could provide us with you know, an idea of what the, the language is going to be, because when I look at this form and we're, I don't know if we're gonna be um, approving it, it, it just looking at it the way it is, I know you're saying that the parent isn't expected and they're not gonna fill it out, but I'd like to have a more thorough view of what it's going to say. Th th that's understood and that's something we've discussed uh, since your discussion with the general counsel yesterday. Ms. Ayala. Thank you. I wanna say thanks to you all for working on implementing the state board rule into our policy. Um, my biggest concern is what Dr. Sheffield was mentioning, right? You mentioned the privacy of our students. Um, I understand that we have to implement state board rules into our policies and follow the law. My concern um, when I went to the state board rule and read through the policy as it was presented in state um, administrative code, it talks about parental transparency parental rights, and student safety. And to me, this issue could turn into something of student well-being, acceptance, and inclusivity. Mm -hmm. So I really want to just stress and thank you all in anticipation for the work to be done to make sure that our students are protected and all feel included when we're going on to field trips that may include this you know, very rare instance of overnight lodging that is required. Most of the field trips do not require that, but I just really want to thank you all for making sure that we're remembering our goal of equity and inclusivity when we're looking through these policies. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you, you, Doctor. Are you finished with your presentation? Yes, I am. We'll okay. be back for our development on November the 30th, and we have taken the comments from Mrs. Grove. 
Thank you. I didn't want you to leave before you were done, so thank you. Well, Dr. Sheffield's going to stick around for us. I believe we have a, another okay. policy, 8.01, Promotion, Placement, Graduation, Student Progression Plans. This is three workshops in one day for Dr. Sheffield. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, <laughs> She's an impressive lady. Yeah. Give us just a minute. We are having some technical difficulties here. Okay. Okay, so again, I am back. Um, now this time we are transitioning from policy 2.40 to our to policy 8.01. It's our student pupil progression policy. I am going to, um, you know, ask that you um, bear with me. Um, we really did a deep dive here with our student progression policy, um, you know, this year. And I have attached, you know, the red line document along with a summary of changes um, for each of you, as well as the PowerPoint. Um, so I'm going to try to go through this. I'm not reading, I'm reading it verbatim. But the scope of this policy, um, of course, is just to make certain that we are um, aligned with, of course, you know, Florida statute um, and all of the most recent um, legislative updates and so forth. And this particular policy, um, of course, the big chunk of it is K through 12. And I have added um, the last part of it. You will see that we've added in the adult ed component. And this particular slide here, as I said, I'm just going to go through this one time, is that a lot of the changes within this plan is around the new um, FS, moving from FSA to the you know, FAST assessment. Um, our Florida assessment for student thinking, and then of course moving from the Florida standards to the best standards. Then we also have around our next generation um, over to you know our statewide academic standards. And then as I talked earlier about our best standards, just making certain that we've replaced everything, updating it throughout to the benchmark for excellence with student teaching. And um, and of course, making reference to our best standards for our access points. So the first part of it is, is a deep dive around just transitioning from our old assessment to our new assessment system, the same thing for our new standards. Then we go into, you know, just talking as it pertains to this first bullet, making sure that we are being inclusive for all students and every family and students have an opportunity um, to register into our schools and not making it um, a hassle for them. In this particular form, just making certain that we put into people entry, um, initial entry requirements is that the 0636, that is our student registration form, but with an understanding um, to our school centers, to our families, that they have an option of submitting their registration form digitally, um, excuse me, utilizing the computer and as well electronically as well as paper base, we wanted to make certain that that was included there within the in the plan because there was some confusion around it. That parents do have the option to submitting a paper based registration form, and of also and of course updating some language around the opportunities for student for students reassignment. And we wanted to just make certain because we do have our exchange students, um, you know, that tends to come over. Um, so we wanted to also put the language in there for our international exchange transfer students to make certain that we were being consistent here across the district. And on this particular slide here, um, we've updated a lot of the language and I've listed on the, um, on this particular slide, the pages, um, pages 28, 58, and 138. This is where you will see in terms of how we had to clarify um, some language around our students um, with disability. So as I said, we made it a, you know, we did a deep dive with this plan. I tried to cut down the slides from almost 50 slides down to 20 some slides so we can get through it. So I made a point to just highlight for you the pages and the kind of language of what we needed to do 
on each of those areas. And you can see there on page 28, we just clarified the process and making certain that everyone understood that for our ESE students, that it was at age 14 or when they enter grade nine, when they needed to determine if they were going to um, their diploma option. And then page 58 talks around updating the graduation op options for our students with disability. And then page 138 just talks around the, the decision that needed to be made um, for the standard diploma or the scholar merit de designation. And this last part here, which is very important, is that, you know, the past two years we have dealt a lot with COVID. So we have gone through the student progression plan and we've removed all of the COVID-19 language because there are a lot of language that we needed to do the past two years um, within our student progression plan regarding COVID. So all the COVID language has been removed. The high school update, um, this is not new. It was actually in our plan, but we have cleaned it up to where the, all our high school students, grades nine and 11, I should say, not all of them, but our students in grade nine and 11, where they're required to um, complete the first aid and CPR instruction. And we've just specified in it. Initially, it was tied into a course. We've taken it from a course because schools wanted to have options and they should have the option on where this requirement is being met. And we've also added the portfolio requirement for our JROTC. Um, this is a component here that's been um, available for our students, but it was not there in our pupil, student pupil progression plan, and we have included it in there. And we've also spelled out around our accelerated coursework, you know, from advanced placement to IB um, to ACE and so forth. On this particular slide here, um, around the elementary updates, what we've done with these bullets here it's just that we've updated all of the language um, for the new year, again, around all of the statues, you know, particularly I'll go to the third bullet there, it talks about the reading, remediation, what that is there, it just talks in regards to our students that are intensive reading or our students that have been retained, um, what are the qualifications that the teacher must have um, for those students that are receiving the remediation based on the tier or the category in which they fall in. So all those are the kind of updates that were added um, there. And then of course, you know, nothing has changed around us notifying our parents around K-3 reading deficiency. It is a statue that we sent out notifications to our parents um, for K-3 um, if those students are not there on grade level. And of course, we needed to update the language around the good cause exemption for our grade three students. I made a notation on this particular slide um, that it is something new in two pupil progression. It has not been in here before. And we piloted this program last year and it was a jump start to middle school program um, from our fourth grade students that have had multiple retentions and so forth to where we did an intense program with them over the summer. If they had successfully completed the program over the summer, those students, um, those students went on transition to middle school in grade six with a cohort. And then of course the schools have um, those students where they're placed on school-based team, where they have a monitoring, they're constantly monitoring those students to make sure they receive the academic support that is needed. This particular program is similar to the Jumpstart to high school program that we have there in our middle school. So this initiative is brand new, and we're now including it into pupil progression. On slide nine, slide nine is our dual enrollment. Um, we're adding language for our dual enrollment students, particularly um, home ed students, because our home education students, they do have an opportunity, and by law, um, can participate in, um, in dual enrollment. So we wanted to add the language there to where there was no confusion. And also there have been some update, um, updates from Palm Beach State and FAU. Those are the two um, colleges that our students participate in um, that we have an articulation agreement with for dual enrollment. And Palm Beach State, Palm Beach State, you could see there has an unweighted GPA of a 3.2. And the change really was with FAU 
where they've moved from an unweighted GPA to a weighted GPA of a 3.8, which actually had identified about 1,400 additional students um, that would have qualified, that qualifies for our participation in dual enrollment. This is also new, a new piece that we are adding into pupil progression for um, this year. And working with um, Mr. Oswald and his team, um, of course, what we have found is that with, you know, with COVID um, these past two years, and it's not just our COVID, but in trying to re-engage our students, we have found that there are many students out there have not have re-engaged, uh, have not been engaged even prior to COVID. And they're coming in, they're registering, and we, there's, there were no consistency, and we did not have a policy per se, nothing in pupil progression that could give us clear guidance to where we were being consistent as a district in regards to placing the students appropriately, what we felt that would be appropriate if they showed up without having any form of um, school records or what have you. So this particular piece here that we're adding, students with interrupted education, is providing clearer guidance for our school centers for um, in regards to how we would work with the students and their families on re-engaging them back into um, the educational setting to where we can get our students graduated and serve them appropriately. This is also an exciting new piece that is being added into pupil progression this year. This is new legislation that came in um, as it pertains to our ELL students, and it's providing them a, um, another opportunity um, for our students um, if they were having a difficult time and being successful on the state assessment, you know, that grade 10 um, ELA. Opportunity for those students um, to have to where they, another pathway for them to graduate high school. And this is new legislation that we're adding, particularly for our ELL students that we're excited about. On this particular slide here is around our graduation requirements for our standard diploma students. And again, um, we're just specifying most importantly um, in regards to um, just updating those subject areas, but including the accelerated coursework that our students are also involved in and then providing some clarity for our schools um, around grade forgiveness and some areas that have always been there as it pertains to legislation, but it was not called out in pupil progression. And we wanted to make certain that we were calling out and providing every opportunity in pupil progression to where whatever opportunity was there for our students, that we made certain that it was there, it was clear um, for our schools and the counseling team to ensure success for our students. And then, of course, we wanted to make certain that we spelled out um, in regards in students' understanding that they were promoted. The promotion always took place, particularly our 12th grade students, at the beginning of the semester. It was not clear for our families or some of the students at times, and we decided that we needed to put it in pupil progression, particularly those that were deemed to be early graduates. Another... Um, new um, piece that we're adding into our pupil progression, and again, this comes from legislation this year that you've probably heard about was around our bright, bright futures. Bright futures, we know our students must have um, community service hours. Well, now um, came July 1, they, it's not just community service hours, there are also aspects of work hours that will count that our students could use, work hours to, um, towards their bright futures, um, points and so forth. So we've added this in to, again, to make certain that it is clear. We're working with the schools now, providing clarity around that. We're also working with developing some cadence that the schools will be able to utilize as they're documenting the students' work hours. Again, this is brand new. This is another opportunity for students to earn their bright futures because we understand that many times they're not able to do the volunteer hours because they need to work. So this is really helping those families to where the students are also working, they could count in their work hours. It's just a continuation um, of the bright futures and making certain that our families, the students, they understood the difference between their volunteer hours and their work hours, that there were some differences. So we left, we didn't want any assumptions out there, so we've just added the chart in.
to provide clarity around it. We're also um, updating within our plan. We've decided to add that the, you know there are five different diploma options and we are calling out in our pupil progression plan because we did not call out the career and technical ed pathway. And this is the pathway that our students could start, you know, in secondary. And if there is a, if that pathway is there at the state college or what have you, they can continue on at the state college in that same pathway. That has always been, but it was not called there within pupil progression and we wanted to add it in to pupil progression. This particular part here, we decided it's not new. It's always been in legislation, and we're just adding in for clarity. Um, and you can see the language that we are removing. But this particular um, slide here just talks in regards to you know the calculation of um, grades for our high school our high school students, and that the exemptions of seniors from semester exams and so forth. So we wanted to add the language to make certain that it was clear when it came to semester exam time. And on this particular slide, what we've done, again, we have the new standards, um, new standards, new state assessment. We've taken out all of the old and we've added in the new standards and the most importantly, the new assessments that are aligned to the new standards. And this is, again, around elementary, uh, K-5. And this particular slide here, we would have had to do the same for grades 6 through 12 in updating our standards and updating the assessments to match the standards, the new standards. And you could see here, um, particularly, we've added the language around the new state progress monitoring. And that was the first part that I went over was all around the K-12. Um, and I went through the changes as it pertains to the K-12 portion of the student academic, excuse me, student pupil progression plan. And now um, I'll transition over to the adult and community ed. And within the adult and community ed plan, um, there have been no policy changes. Um, they, all they have done was just updated their language as it pertains to um, statutory requirements, just making certain that all of those links were updated and they worked. So there were no major changes to the adult ed plan. And then they did some um, grammatical er um, edits. So that would have taken us through the student progression plan for K-12, as well as, again, the update to the adult ed plan where there were no changes. And our next time will be the development and then the adoptions with the necessary dates. Any questions, Mrs. Andrews? I love the new CTE uh, insertion uh, for the diploma. So that was great, Dr. Sheffield. This is all great work. Now, this is just a small question right here where we're on page uh, seven for the reading remediation. Uh, updated per the Florida mm -hmm. statute 1008.25, mostly for parents. I don't have this happening a lot, but sometimes students are doing great in school, uh, making great grades, but yet and still when they take a test, they're scoring uh, not where they should be, and then they end up in a reading remediation. What's the process for a parent uh, uh, when that happens to a student. You may be making all A's and B's, look like you're on track for everything, then you were identified on a particular test that you took one day and you didn't make it. What do we tell a parent as to, you know, when they say they don't really think their children need that remediation? Well, well we do, um, you know, we deal with that, Ms. Andrews, a lot, um, and it all ties back into statute that says if the student score any per certain cent, um, percentile, you know, per today a level one or what have you, that they must go into, you know, that intensive reading. We do have um, the intervention tree, the reading placement tree in regards, and we work with our parents, and we just talk in regards to um, the, the interventions and the resources that we would do to work alongside with them and that child to try to get them to exit out. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's all tied to legislation. We cannot pull them out. Um, we just work with them. We work with the student. We work with the teachers to try to get them to exit. But we constantly get the question in regards to, you know, my child, you know, is a straight A student. However, they took this one assessment. 
um, and they did not do well because they are not a test taker. Um, and we understand that. And we just work with the parent, we work with the school, and try to put some resources in there to ensure their success to where they could come out, per se, the following year. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sheffield. Yes, so we have two more workshops. The next one up, and thank you, Ms. Carmona, as well, for your help. Uh, the next up is Policy 8.14, Home Education Program. So we're going to invite up Mr. Ed Tierney, Deputy Superintendent, and Mr. Brad Henry, Director of Palm Beach Virtual School, which oversees our home education program. Sir, thanks. Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chairwoman, Mrs. Brill, school board members, Superintendent Burke, I'm pleased to offer the policy workshop on 8.14 from Home Education Policy. I'm joined by Director of Virtual and Home Education, Mr. Brad Henry, and Ms. Lisa Carmona. This should be a quick policy workshop. There are very little changes. They basically boil down to facilitating the transmission of information from home to school, home, school to home electronically, and then what we feel is a relatively inconsequential change in annual evaluation dates. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Henry. Good evening, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, we're going to go through the um, um, home education policy 8.14, and uh, this is an update that we're doing because we haven't had an update since 2008. And all the components of the PowerPoint responsibility of uh, Florida Statute State 1002.41, which is the parents' right to establish a home education program. Now, there are three things that are required of parents when they come in the home education program. That's the notice of intent, annual evaluation, and notice, notice of intermination. And then we're going to talk a little bit about assessment. So these are all things where, that will be have been updated through state statute. So number one is with the notice of intent. As you know, anything that you see in red and underlined is new. And um, it just talks about that they're allowed to um, submit it within 30 days of establishing the home education program. And what they want us to add was the notice may be sent to the home education office by U.S. mail, email, with a true signature on attachment, fax, or hand delivery. And additionally, electronic notice of intent is now available on the school district website. And that can be completed as an option. And then we go into the submission of the annual evaluation. The annual evaluation has to be submitted by the anniversary date of every single year. Um, no matter when that anniversary date. If I came in in May, then that's my anniversary date. If I came in in October, then that's my anniversary date. And again, notice of intent with the Home Education Office, the annual evaluation may be submitted no earlier than eight weeks before the anniversary of the notice of intent, and a 30-day extension may be granted upon request. And this was already in the policy, but just to remind you that five ways parents can submit an evaluation. That is through a Florida certified teacher reviewing their work, a nationally normed student achievement test, state student assessment test at one of our local schools, um, through a psychologist, an official transcript from an accredited program. Um, if a student happens to be on probationary status, that means that they have not been doing the annual evaluation um, up to somebody did not certify it, then in writing, we do need to give them um, the information regarding the continuation of being in home education is in contingent upon them demonstrating educational progress at the end of one year probation period. So they pretty much get a probation period of one year. Now, um, the next section is with um, pro the proposed revision. It's um, eligibility for particip participation in any public school program. So for example, that first one, 8A, um, where it says subjects to the requirements of Florida statute 1006.115. They're talking about students being able to participate in interscholastic and inter intrascholastic extracurricular st uh, student activities at our schools, any school in Palm Beach County. Um, and again, it goes with the Bright Future Scholarship Program in accordance with Florida law. 
and as uh, Dr. Shepard had mentioned a little bit earlier, um, dual enrollment programs, so home education programs are eligible for a career um, enrollment and early admission and credit by examination, including admission to community colleges and admissions to state universities. And then the last one is um, they're also eligible for virtual instruction. Now, we already had Florida virtual school. Um, 2008, Palm Beach virtual did not exist, so we've added Palm Beach virtual also um, in here as well to go along with stat, uh, statute 1002.455. And that just means that says that students are eligible for uh, K-12 virtual education. Now, the other thing that the parents are required to have is when they decide to leave um, home education, they have to give us a termination, a notice of a termination. And that lets us know that they are going to be leaving. They must give us a copy and an, an evaluation. Um, so that we have that on file, and um, that's filed by the parent or the guardian. And again, an optional electronic notice is now of ter termination is now available on the school district home education website. Um, this proposed um, one for number 12, it's an enrollment in a public school. So when a student leaves um, home education and they are enrolling back into one of our brick and mortar schools, this just says that the administrator or their designee will look through the uh, student's educational curriculum, portfolio, and evaluations um, to make their grade selections prior to placement or credit decision. And um, this one is regarding the assessments. So industry certifications, national assessments, and statewide standardized assessments offered by a school district shall be available to home education program students each school district shall notify home education program students of the available certifications and assessments, the date, time, and locations for the administration of each certification and assessment, and the deadline for notifying the school district of the student's intent to participate and the student's preferred location. And that's all of the updates. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Uh, you mentioned in the policy that if the students or the families fail to certify the student, they're put on, placed on probation mm -hmm. for one year and then it's reassessed at the end of that year? Correct. If it's, if they do not meet that reassessment or fall short, what happens? Are they expelled from home education and yeah. sent back to school? Yeah, so what happens is then um, we meet together as a team and we have to sit down with the parent and we have to review the information that has been given to us. If they have not met it at home education, then they are required to go back to, uh, preferably, a brick and mortar school. Um, back in within the school district of Palm Beach County. The, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. And I don't even know if you can answer this question for me, but you know we know that students with disabilities, and it's in the policy, are um, able to receive their services at their at their zone school. That is correct. But my question, um, and maybe Ms. Cremona can answer it, is, you know, we can't do RTI if they're home, right? And if it's a young student. How do we determine the need for the services and, and how are they implemented? Because I know there's a process of observation and th things like that. How are we addressing it with younger students? Do you want to take it? Okay. I will, I'm going to start and then Lisa will piggyback. So the home education program is totally parent supervised, as you know, it's, they're the principal, they're the teacher, guidance counselor, they're the SBT type of person. So if a student is already identified as a student with an individual education plan and they go into home education, they are eligible, I mean, they are eligible, as you know, to come back into our schools and get those services. Now, if a student is in a program and they are beginning to have difficulty and whatnot, that is on the parent to seek out uh, help and further help for their student. That doesn't come back to the school district. If I may follow up. So let's say a student is, is at home and they realize that there's some issues, you know, um, and they get them evaluated, right? Yep. Um, and there's some services, maybe it's occupational therapy that all of a sudden they're having, you know, problems writing. That's on the parent to provide it if they can bring in a, an evaluation? Well, no, or the, do you the home, evaluate them? No, 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 the home education department would, and, and had we, you know, been aware of this, perhaps we would have asked Mr. McCormick or Ms. Pincus to come down and help us out with answering these particular questions. But we can certainly take those questions right. back to the team, and we will get the answers to sure. you. Yep. 
and, and as just as a follow up, I can also you can just have them call me, and you know okay. I don't think I have to bore everybody with okay. those questions. But thank you. Okay. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you all for bringing this policy. You know, home education is just another choice for parents. Yes. And you know, we'd love everyone to be in our brick and mortar schools, but parents understand home education. They know how to get that done. I meet a lot of them, and they kind of work toward what's best for their children. Many of them return back to us when they get older. And when I look at the policy, it's easy to understand, and parents know how to implement this and feel pretty good about it as another choice for them. So I'm glad you brought this forward uh, for them to know. But it's also great to know that when they need help, with actually maneuvering this policy. I've never had anybody that complain to me when they says I'm going to uh, go with home education. Apparently you're doing a great job over there because I never hear from them again. They get it started and I see them out and about with their programs now, their extracurricular programs and doing a lot of different things because it's now a broader scope for home education with a whole lot of auxiliary pieces of it that doesn't involve us at all. Right. But correct. kids do get those benefits and then they many times return back to us. So mm -hmm. it's just another choice. Thank you all for the great work that you do. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Okay, and that will bring us to our final workshop for the day, Policy 1.0971, District Diversity and Equity Committee, led by our Chief of Equity and Wellness, Mr. Keith Oswald, and Ms. Janina Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Burke, and good afternoon, board members. Presentation here. Also join us, our legal expert, Ms. Yolanda Morgan. So the District Diversity and Equity Committee took a deep dive into reviewing the policy, in particular looking at the organizations that have either dissolved and potentially of missing student voice, and are bringing forth um, through my office as well um, as through the superintendent's office some of these recommendations and revisions to the policy. So first is to add two non-voting members, members, one from the Classroom Teachers Association and as well as from the Palm Beach County School Administrators associations, so issues do come up sometimes where it would really be helpful for the group to have, you know, school administrator voice as well as a teacher voice. Um, in addition, a name change for the Puerto Rican Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to reflect its current name of Florida Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce slash Palm Beach County. The Agencies that are listed here on this particular slide, the first three have, have dissolved, so we do not have, obviously, a particular avoid for our students who identify as Haitian. Um, in addition, the West Palm Beach cha chapter of the NAACP is no longer um, active. So the following recommendations are to add uh, Connect to Greatness. This is an organization that works with uh, black male students, so they primarily serve, uh, uh, they do have a large uh, population of Hispanic male students as well um, as students who are African American. Volunteer Association of America, we have been partnering with this organization in different um, aspects of the organization, in particular to that they represent the Haitian student population. Uh, after contact with the NAACP at the uh, state level, they recommend to add South Palm Beach County Branch. And then there was a lot of discussion of other potential voices that are missing from the organization and um, students who are in the foster care system are students who are quite vulnerable and their success depends on a lot of support um, as we all know. So the recommendation is to add friends of foster children. Following recommendations really reflect policy 1.09, ensuring that uh, we're in alignment to allow for our uh, organizations to appear uh, in person or virtually. 
Um, and just to clean up the language regarding alternate in that they would count to the quorum if the primary person is not able to attend. And the same here on this particular slide as well. Um, and those are the recommendations, so at this time we'll open it up um, for any questions, comments. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Mrs. Andrews? Yeah, this might fall under, under foster children, but you know we have a lot of homeless children. Is there any particular group uh, that could help us with that because they're not all in, in foster care and hopefully we can get them into a home, but we have a lot of children that are in that umbrella of homelessness. We did have a, a, a long discussion about students who are in a homeless situation. Um, there is a lot of work being done in that space um, from the school district. We do have kind of a aligned group that we're meeting monthly with anyone who's supporting any of the a, uh, agencies or organizations that are supporting students that are homeless. Um, and we, then we debated whether or not, because of the size of the current size of the DDC with 22 voting members, how many? Because we kept going to one that now we're up to 27 agencies. We got one point. We got to back that up. So we are definitely open to the board if we wanted to add another um, organizations to represent the students who identify as homeless, because that was definitely um, part of our conversations, and we debated it. So we would be open to that. Yeah, I would be open to that because I just know uh, that that's a big issue. Uh, and if we have an organization that can represent them, because it's totally different than the foster parent. Absolutely. The, the rest of the board okay with that? We'll add a, another organization for that. Mr. Oswald, let me ask you a question about the foster, friends of foster children. What organization is that? I've not heard that organization before uh, so they're uh, they work closely with ChildNet, so they'll take a lot of uh, direct referrals um, similar to you're familiar with best foot forward so they do similar work um, they have a, a little bit larger volume they're working closely also with DCF um, so we went back on a couple different organizations and we landed uh, with potentially adding friends of foster uh, and now I'm going blank on the name, but um, so Friends of Foster Children. So they do similar work, but some different different type of support and services to kids who are in the foster care system. All right. Uh, if, if it's okay, I'd, I'd like to see a comparison between Best Foot Forward and Friends of Foster Children. I've been on that board for since its inception 12 years ago, and I know that they deal with both the elementary, they deal with our elementary, middle, and high school children that are in foster care. So... Um, and, and I know they've done a great job, and they work closely, as you know, in, in many, many of our schools. They're already in many of our schools. So I'd like to see a comparison between the two before the board is asked to make a final decision on which organization, uh, if we could all see a comparison. Sure, absolutely, no problem. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Fine. Thank you. That concludes the workshops. Thank you. Do we need a motion to adjourn the workshop. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Ms. Ayala. All in favor? Opposed, motion carries 6 0. <laughs> All right, we'll open the special meeting. Uh, in light of the fact that one board member is missing, uh, would you please call the, uh, call the roll again, Ms. Pallotta? District 1, Barbara McQuinn? Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala? Here. District 3, Karen Brill? Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield? Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri? Here. District 6, Marsha Andrews? Here. And District 7, Deborah Robinson's absent. All right. We have quorum with six board members in attendance. Um, we have no items to add for good cause. Mr. Superintendent, are you withdrawing any items? No withdrawals. I did move policy IG1 to new business. We need a motion to approve the agenda as modified by the superintendent. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Ms. Mrs. Andrews. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Disclosures and abstentions? Any? Seeing none, we're under superintendent board comments. Mr. Superintendent? Yes. Uh, Hispanic Heritage Month runs a, a few more days here, and I'm proud to say that the district has taken part in many events. 
uh, celebrating the heritage, culture, and contributions of Hispanic Americans in our community. Uh, as an example, we had the district's Office of Div Diversity and Business Practices celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month with a, uh, a conference of local businesses, his Hispanic owned businesses, and you know how they can partner and work with the school district. Uh, we've also had the Hispanic Heritage Bus Tour, pay a visit to Oak Hill Middle School and their International Spanish Academy. And then also we were able to celebrate our sixth International Spanish Academy that was been opened now at Palm Springs Middle School. And we've got a, a short video of that event. Should be coming any minute. No video? It's coming. I have to come back. Okay, we'll come back to that video. Uh, on Monday, October 17th, the Florida Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce for Palm Beach County will also be presenting Hispanic Heritage Awards for 2022. Uh, we're hoping that several members of our district will be recognized, including some of our teachers, sports, business, uh, and some of this, and we'll have student performances as part of this celebration as well. Uh, Ms. Ayala wisely put a set of new tires on her car going into Hispanic Heritage Month. And it was a smart thing to do. She's been very busy. Uh, and all the board members have been out and about. Uh, it's, it's been a great month. And uh, earlier today, it was a walk and bike to school day. And so we celebrated that at 52 of our elementary schools. I haven't got confirmation, but I'm told we may have had more schools than any other district in the nation. Uh, I had a chance to, uh, to head out to Everglades Elementary and walk in with some of the students and parents and uh, it was really nice. It's just an event to raise awareness. You know, we've got 190,000 school-aged children going back and forth to school every day, and we want everyone to, to look out and be careful, uh, put their phones down, and uh, keep an eye on the road. And then also for our students, if they're able to do that and walk or ride their bike to school, it's a great way to get a little exercise. So I don't think we have a video of that. It's just that's late-breaking news. Uh, another thing I'm really excited about is on your agenda tonight, we were able to reach an MOU agreement with SEIU to increase bus driver pay again that will bring the starting pay to $20 per hour and any existing driver will see an increase of $2.75 per hour. This is the second raise in uh, a, you know, a few months. We had done a raise at the end of last school year. So those two raises combined will have increased our bus driver pay by over $5 per hour, which is a considerable change. I'm really hopeful that this will help turn the tide and allow us. Uh, we've had some success as of late recruiting drivers, but not enough. And uh, we have uh, many jobs to fill. So I'm really hopeful that this will make a big difference. This will make our bus drivers the highest paid in the state of Florida. And then, of course, uh, you know, our heart, our heart and thoughts are, and prayers remain with uh, Southwest and Central Florida in the wake of Hurricane Ian. Uh, the devastation over there is incredible, particularly Lee County. Uh, some of our schools have. Uh, taken upon themselves to, to do supply f drives and do some fundraising. Uh, just a few, Palm Beach Public Elementary School, Woodlands Middle School, and Sandpiper Shores Elementary. Uh, we're also directing folks through our website to the Florida Disaster Fund, if, if anybody is able and willing to uh, donate money. Uh, it, it's certainly needed. So, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my comments. All right. Board comments, Ms. McQuinn, no. Ms. Ayala, no. Ms. Whitfield, no. Mrs. Andrews? I can always count on you, Mrs. Andrews. Absolutely, yes. have a lot to say. And first of all, uh, thank you to the Village of Wellington. You're always so awesome, a front runner in everything that you do. Uh, Mr. Burke, uh, Mr. Tierney, you were out there with me last night with all the principals, uh, the area, the region uh, officials. When the Village of Wellington, as always, cares so much about their students, the Keeley Spinelli, and many of you knew Keeley. She was one of our employees who was so outstanding within the school district of Palm Beach County. 
and she passed away at an early age, but she left footprints on how to be the best teacher, the best administrator, and the best you could be in creating wonderful academic uh, successes for our children. Uh, the Village of Wellington has been giving the Keeley Spinelli grant for 21 years, and last night they gave $400,000 to all of the Wellington schools. We thank them, we thank our schools for doing great work. That money is used for those students that are in need, many of them in the uh, uh, lowest 25%, the support area that we have to give them, they partner with us. And I'm asking the superintendent if we can bring the Village of Wellington uh, uh, elected officials and education board uh, to this boardroom and bring that big check of $400,000 and make sure that they know how much we appreciate their partnership. And yes, Wellington is outstanding. I was there this morning at seven at Wellington Elementary School. I don't know if there's a video of that, but I was out there walking this morning and I got all of my exercise with all of those children that had to, they started at the church, which is almost about not too far from the school, but it was a good little hike. I took that hike to the church and back and I was sweating a little bit, but those kids said, yes, we love to walk to school. You saw all those bikers, all those parents, they were so excited to participate and walk your children to school today and ride your bike to school today. It was just nice being out there, a little muggy, but we got it done. <laughs> and the last thing I want to tell you about, it's so exciting uh, to be out there with our children and within our schools. Glade Central High School Homecoming. If you weren't there, I need to share the pictures with you. It was awesome last Friday where you had all of those children. It was Western Day uh, for homecoming. And everybody had on a, a cowboy hat, including Miss Andrews. And we were out there with our little uh, vests on and we were had the crowns on for the kings and the queens and all of the floats. They had the kids from the nursery. They all had their Western wear on. I mean, every queen had something to uh, replicate being from the wild, wild west. And so you had a Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Boys and Girls Club Western style. You had uh, a king of Rosenwald Elementary School, a queen of uh, Canal Point Elementary School. Pioneer Park, you were awesome as always. You had so many floats, the bands from, from Gladeview, the floats, Rosenwald, Lakeshore, everybody was out there. And the whole community of the Glades, they were out there last Friday. I had never seen so many people come out uh, to a parade. And I think it's because we're out from the pandemic. It was so packed. It was so lovely. I took a lot of pictures. It was great. We love it being here in Palm Beach County Schools, and we participate in our communities. Thank you. Ms. Brill? The only comments I have are I reached out to the chairwoman of the Lee County School Board. Her name is Debbie Jordan, and I told her that our board stood ready to help them in any way we can. So she said she wasn't sure at that point what we could do to help, but she said she'd call on us if, if there was something we could do to help their, their school board. Um, also, on uh, September 22nd, we had the dedication of Blue Lake Elementary School. Uh, Mrs. Whitfield was with, with me there. I wish, and Ms. And Ms. Burrell, I'm sorry. Uh, I wish all of you could see the school. It's absolutely beautiful. It, as you all know, it's the first brand new school we've added to the portfolio in, since 2010, I believe. So it's a great addition. Brings us to 180 schools. The superintendent, of course, was there. Uh, but when, if you get a chance, I know uh, Principal Maldivan would love to show off his brand new school. So for those of you that haven't seen it, if you give him a call, he likes to brag about it. So you can go down there <laughs> and see what's going on. We have no agenda item speakers. Board, board. Thank you. Um, board members, are there any items you wish to pull from consent? Seeing none, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Vice Chairwoman Brill. Any discussion all in favor? Opposed? Uh, motion carries 6-0. That will take us to new business. The first item, Mr. Superintendent, is LR1. Yes. <clears throat> I recommend the board approve the attached tentative agreement pending, pending ratification by SEIU FPSU. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Mrs. McQuinn. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, yes. 
And I, I would like to report that the SEIU was able to ratify last Friday. So with your approval, we're good. This will go into effect October 8th. Yeah. Great. Thank um, you, Mr. Or Mr. as of October 8th. Yes, POL IG1. Let me just get there. I recommend the board approve development of proposed revision of number two policy 1.092 inspector general. Motion by Vice Chairwoman Brill, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. So the last thing on this agenda will be the board discussion item that I put on there with respect to the Florida High School Athletic Association requirements with respect to the student medical data. So what I wanted to do with this item is, first of all, make you all aware of the conversations that I've had that I can't tell you about when we're not in these meetings, as well as make sure the public understands what we can and can't do with respect to this. So as, as you all know, because we're all getting the emails, it, you know, this came up initially with respect to the question that deals with female, females. Uh, I won't say anything <laughs> further than females. Um, and so um, I got a copy of the form, and I've got a copy for all of you. It's a three-page form. Ms. Brill, if you pass that down. So my understanding is, after I checked, that this form has been around for 20 years. It hasn't been changed. Uh, Mr. Ars is in the audience, and he's on the FH, FHSAA board, and, and I spoke with him today, and he confirmed that this, this, this uh, form has been around for 20 years. It's not been changed. Um, my belief in, in uh, you know, is that it should be changed. And, and not only should it be changed, but neither any of us nor anybody else in this district has any business knowing about the, the health conditions of, of or the health, you know, the health conditions of our, of our students other than, I, I ask you to turn to the last page, and would you put that up on the screen? So the last page is the only page that I think we need. That's the page that, that the, the doctor signs and says that the student is either cleared without limitation has a disability, is not cleared. That's all we need to know. Unfortunately, FHSA doesn't agree with that. I had the district reach, that, reach out to them, and they're refusing to change it for Palm Beach County, saying that it's the same throughout the state, and they're not going to change it. Um, I know that Mr. Ars has arranged for the executive director of FHSA to call me and also call the superintendent to discuss it, but... Um, just, you know, just to point out to the public, you know, we don't want the form. I personally don't think the form should be there. I, I don't think we should be asking questions. I mean, if you notice on page two, it says, you know, that we, we examine the boys and we, and we make a, a finding, the doctor makes a finding of abnormal findings with respect to the boys' genitalia. I mean, I, I have no idea what sport that a boy's genitalia would have any relevance to. Um, so, I mean, those kind of questions, I mean, I don't even know why we need to know that and nor does the FHSA need to know that, nor do our coaches or our schools need to know that. Uh, if you look at the first page, have you had high, pleasure, high blood pressure or high cholesterol? Well, if the, if the doctor asks that question and that box is checked, but he says the, the student is cleared without any disabilities, is it now up to the coach or the school to determine, well, the kid has high blood pressure, so he shouldn't play? So I looked up what are the dangers of playing sports with high blood pressure, and I read, if you have high blood pressure, you should avoid physical activity that requires sudden bursts of activity, such as in football, or strain as those may increase the risk of arterial rupture, heart attack, or stroke. So are we opening up our cell to liability? Because if that box is checked and we have it, and the coach lets the kid go out and play and he has a stroke, I mean, even though the doctor cleared him, I'm sure that the school board will get sued because it's on the form. So we don't need to see this stuff. I mean, it opens, I talked to the general counsel, it opens us up to additional liability. So what I'd like the board to do, you know, and I understand that the, the state weighed in on it today. The state, the state indicated that either the governor's office or the state board said they see no problem with this form as long as that question with respect to the females is optional, which all of you can see on the first page it says optional. Females only, but it says optional. So the, if it's optional, it means the, the doctor can put N.A. on all those lines and and, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is with the, the, the state's, you know, push to have total transparency, parental involvement. I mean, the parent picks the doctor, takes the child to the doctor, tells the doctor that my son wants to play football. Would you do an examination and then let me know whether my son is cleared? And then the doctor gives the parent a note, which is the third page. It says the child is cleared to play football. I mean, what more do we need? This leaves it all among the parent, the doctor, and the, and the student to decide 
what they want to do with respect to that third page. So m my thought is that we put some pressure on the State Board of Education to get involved in this and force FHSA to change the to, to change their guidelines with respect to what's required by a school district and what isn't. I know Mr. Ars is on that board and he's indicated that he's willing to, I guess you have a, Mr. Ars, would you come up to the podium there please? I know we don't normally do this, but he's on the state board on this and he's indicated a willingness to put forward an amendment to their, to their policies to try and help the school district with this issue. Mr. Ars. Good afternoon. Is this on? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, Vice Chair, all the school board members. Good to see you. Can't wait for November 8th. That way everything is back to normal. <laughs> so in terms of this, look, when I told Mr. Barbieri this today. When I was a legislator, one of my first bills was to eliminate the FHSA. Because sometimes they act and they really don't serve their clientele. They almost act independently. So when you look at this form, it was 20 some years ago. This form has been used. It has not been revised, and it should be revised. I asked my expert in my house, is there any business of the state of Florida to know uh, something about our daughters? And, and she said no, and I go with her, her recommendations. So this Friday is my deadline to submit an agenda item for the November board meeting. And at that board meeting, in line with what you're saying, what are the basic things that the state needs to know? and I would say the Florida High School Athletic Association, in order to clear an athlete for competition. That's all that should be there. We do not need anything else. A lot of parents, when they see optional, people don't, sometimes they don't read the details, and all of a sudden you're putting forth information. That information sometimes gets uploaded into some sort of, uh, you know, app technology, and that creates problems in the future for, for these kids. So I'm willing, and I spoke to the superintendent, I spoke to Mr. Bogus today also, that to work together, if I can get a letter from you guys uh, of support for amending the form, that would go a long way. And if we can get Miami-Dade and Broward, uh, Ms. Ms. Ayala recommended that she can try to get some support. All the urban districts to put forward that we'd like to see a change to this form. I'll bring it forward. And if somebody could be at that board meeting, they strategically have it on Sundays, you know, so it's hard, to, it's pretty hard to get there on a Sunday. It's Sunday afternoon um, and then on, on Monday morning. Vice Chair Brill, then uh, Mrs. Thank Mrs. You. Andrews, then Mrs. McQuinn, then Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you, Mr. Arza. And um, I have two suggestions. One is that, um, Mr. Arza, if you're able to contact Andrea Messina at the Florida School Board Association, have her put the word out to all the school boards because you may find that you'll have support from many other school boards as well in the state of Florida. My second suggestion is if it doesn't fly, if we don't get anywhere, we're meeting on our legislative proposals um, in December. So we could add, add something to our legislative platform um, that would help us with this. So I think it could be a two-prong. Um, you know, I think that hopefully we can get other districts or, you know, something goes out on your own to all the districts, um, not necessarily through FSBA, but through all your contacts. I think you'll find a lot of support. And, and hopefully you can get it done. But if not, we can put it on our list. All right. Who do I call in next? Mrs. Sanders? Thank you. I used to sit on uh, the Florida High School Athletic Association Board representing the Florida School Boards Association. And thank you, Mr. Aza, for what you're doing because it's going to be critical, that meeting that comes up in November. Uh, we do have representation coming from Palm Beach County. I've traveled there for about five years as I represented. And so I know our um, person that's in charge of all of our athletics uh, goals, we usually have two or three coaches because it is going to be about the vote, uh, Mr. Arza, and they do allow speakers. A lot of times people don't come and speak, so this is the time that we want to make sure we have letters, speakers, but we want the votes, and the coaches have a lot of power with this when they begin to have an item on the agenda. So we need to uh, coordinate with uh, the athletic directors, some of the coaches coming from all across the state, the big districts, and when they do that vote, that's when it really counts. So uh, hopefully we'll have a representative with Mr. Arza and maybe somebody else that will be sitting there because many times you don't have speakers to these issues at the meeting and it all just flies right through. But this needs to be changed. So I'm just thrilled that you're going to represent us and if we can get a, a cadre of people to get this done. We need to get this removed. Ms. McQuinn, I believe you were next, and then Mrs. Whitfield. 
I'd just like for us to make sure that we don't have any mixed messages that I 100% agree. We only need this last page. We only want this last page. That we don't have any mixed messages coming out from any coaches in Palm Beach County. That this is direction from our school board and we are of one voice about this. Actually, um, Mrs. McQuinn, I asked the superintendent, uh, I'm sorry, Deputy Superintendent Tierney to check with our, co with, our, with our schools to make sure that if this form is not, if there's an NA on those lines that uh, at that point, you know, that they don't, they don't disqualify somebody. So um, we are not using this form other than the, the recommendation from the, from the physician. Mrs. Whitfield, you are next. Thank you, um, and uh, just a huge thank you to you, Mr. Barbieri, for putting this as a discussion item because it's very timely. And thank you, uh, Mr. Arza, for your work to do this. Um, <clears throat> I've gotten a lot of phone calls from families as well concerned about this, this item. The only question I had for the superintendent was, um, is there ever a case that you're hearing about where we're using the information on this form um, within our athletic departments? Is anything... Uh, being checked by our athletic directors to make sure the students are, are okay. Are we are we doing that at all? Not to my knowledge, but I, you know, I, I should probably research that a little bit. I don't want to speak for you know all the schools, all the athletic directors, all the coaches. Uh, we have I don't know if Dr. Sheffield or Mr. Tierney would like to weigh in. We do have Valerie Mieris, our director of athletics, and she might have an assessment. I I suspect you know just. Well, what I've learned through this process and reading the coverage in the newspaper that no, the, the third form is really all we need. That's what other states are doing across the country. And I don't want to put our coaches into a position where they are now some quasi pseudo doctor trying to mitigate any health condition. So I would, I would feel pretty comfortable we could go with this recommendation just to accept the third page. And if we, I don't know how that may impact if we do have to modify behavior out there. Um, I, my sus I suspect not, but I haven't done that full assessment. Well, I'd love you to just checked, but I'm in full agreement. I'm very grateful that we have the support from our state partner, um, Mr. Arza, to be able to work on this. Thank you. Ms. Ayala. I just want to thank our director of district athletics, Valerie Mayaris, for navigating this entire situation. And I know that she will be present at the meeting as well. So um, I appreciate the collaborative relationship that we're able to have with Mr. Arza as our representative for this region. And um, it, this is information that should be between a doctor and a patient. So I'm looking forward to advocating for that. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you, Mr. Ars. I appreciate you coming tonight to help us with this. And in, your, in the next couple of days, I know that you'll be getting the assistance from the superintendent and, and Mr. Bogus to finish up that form. Thank you. So, board members, do you have anything else? If not, we need a motion to adjourn this meeting. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Ms. Ayala. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. And the next item, we have one more. Let me get to the... Uh, And that's the school safety and security FSAT findings, correct, Mr. Superintendent? That's the next one we have. Yes, sir. This is a dedicated special meeting for school safety and security. Uh, this is our FSAT findings, and this is an annual, annual process. Uh, Chief Sarah Mooney and Deputy Chief Vanessa Snow are going to take us through a brief presentation, and then we have a, the board action for a recommend, recommendation. All right, so the record should reflect that all six board members are still in attendance. Did you eat that video? Oh, we could go back to Mr. Smelt. Is the uh, the video available by any chance? We'll take a brief intermission for a video here. Got a thumbs up there. All right, let it roll. are here celebrating the six international Spanish Academy right along with the other five uh, we are um, this is our membership and distinction ceremony uh, that we have every time one of our schools um, gets inducted into the ESA family
I cannot think of a more appropriate way to kick off Hispanic Heritage Month than by celebrating the addition of a new International Spanish Academy in one of our neighboring communities. And these programs are terrific because they honor the culture, the heritage, as well as the dual language program. We want students to hang on to that bilingual skill and their biliteracy because it's going to pay great dividends later in life. Today we celebrate 17 years of partnership between the school district of Palm Beach County and Ministry of Education Spain through the honorable endorsement of six international Spanish academies. The state of Florida has six international Spanish academies, all in Palm Beach County. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. We're just pulling up a presentation here. It wasn't in the video, but at the ISA celebration, we had the dancers uh, that were terrific, and they would, they, I'm learning more about the dancers, they would stomp, kind of stomp their feet, and it would make like a thunderous noise. So when I went up on stage to say a few remarks, I tried to do the same thing. And even though I'm like over 200 pounds, I was wearing kind of heavy shoes, I could not replicate <laughs> the sound. So I'm working on that. <laughs> We're just filling a little time here. Yep. <coughs> Chief could probably do this without the PowerPoint, but. I believe so. Mr. Ramos, I'm shocked that you, you know, the IT doesn't have this working for the chief. I thought that the, is the presentation not attached? Do you not have it in front of you either? You do have we it? We have it on our computers. Okay. Yep. I'll start with the introduction of it anyway. Um, good evening. Thanks for having us back. I appreciate uh, being able to close out the meeting tonight, hopefully. Um, De Deputy Chief Vanessa Snow is going to actually do the presentation of this. This is basically a wrap-up of the, uh, the FSAT assessments that were done um, for this year that need to be or were presented to the state already in October. This is going to be a summary of the findings. Uh, we've covered a lot of these issues and a lot of the recommendations already in, in various workshops and whatnot. Some of them actually came out in the policies today, some of, those, uh, some of the efforts and some of the things that were pointed out that our, our recommendations, not only by the board, but by some of the staff members uh, in, in the district. So I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Chief Snow, because as our designated school safety specialist, um, she's, she's kind of become the resident expert on the technicalities of these assessment tools and the presentation. And hopefully by the end of this, you uh, will not have any questions. But if you do, we are both here and available to answer. So I'll turn it over to Deputy Chief Snow. Thanks, Chief Mooney. Uh, good evening, Chair Barbieri, Vice Chair Brill, board members, and Superintendent Burke when he joins us. Um, so before we get into our findings and recommendations, it may be uh, beneficial to those who are unfamiliar with the FSAT process to just talk about how we got here. So Florida State statute requires that a school security risk assessment be conducted on all schools, both public and charter, uh, each year. And that was done in May and June. Today we are going to discuss those findings and our recommendations and provide uh, the public an opportunity to hear these. And then within 30 days of today's meeting, school police will be providing those findings to the Office of Safe Schools. So the FSAT in general is a 115-page document containing three sections that you can see here, the school profile, campus tour, and strategic security plan. 
In this fiscal year, we completed 218 FSATs. You'll notice a disparity in the uh, numbers between the 174 district operated schools versus the 180 that Chairman Barbieri mentioned earlier, uh, the absence of which are schools such as High Ridge, the Kelly Center, and a couple other schools that were under construction. They did not have FSATs completed in FY23. The FSAT completion process is a very collaborative effort. Uh, it involves the, our, our administrative staff, law enforcement, and our district departments such as facilities, maintenance, equity and wellness purchasing, and security systems, just to name a few. And once these uh, assessments are completed, they are done, they are reviewed for making safety and security site improvements to you as a board. Following the review of our, excuse me, our FSAT assessments, we came up with four areas of recommendations and findings that you see in front of you, safety and security personnel, security enhancements, technology enhancements, and procedural enhancements. Area one, we have found that we, in most cases, in all cases, we meet and in some cases exceed the state required standard of having one safe school officer on all of our campuses from bell to bell. We recommend continuing to provide at least one or more officers on our campuses and continue aggressively recruiting law enforcement uh, candidates to fill our existing vacancies, which will then reduce our reliance on the need to have our local partners supplement our school coverage. As it relates to security enhancements, we have found that schools continue, as appropriately, to request security enhancements to include additions to fencing, lighting, card access, and security cameras on their campuses. We recommend continue district-wide funding for these projects and also creating a district security standards work group that demonstrates in the engagement of many of our internal stakeholders that will allow us to implement strategies and solutions with an equity-based um, parameters. In our technology area, we have found an opportunity to improve our public safety radio coverage. That has been a conversation that we've had over many months. And we recommend conducting in-building radio signal penetration assessments. And that will measure the signal strength and identify where a, uh, appropriate signal enhancement equipment, bi-directional antennas, should be installed on our campuses to enhance the cellular and our radio capacities on our campuses for our officers and staff. Finally, we have some procedural enhancements, and we've noticed that um, the approval of many state requirements, such as uh, building out reunification plans, uh, the implementation and requirement of police officers on our threat assessment teams, and other state requirements has given us an opportunity to refine our processes. So we recommend ongoing training and review of our existing policies to ensure that we are in compliance, continuing the build out of our area reunification plans, and it, as we've discussed before, the build out of the B-Wing remodel for school police, which will enhance our intelligence sharing capabilities amongst our internal department members. May I ask a question? Sure. So we'll be moving out of C-Wing over, everything will be moving to B-Wing? Yes, sir, that's the goal. Okay, thank you. Sure. It is appropriate for us to mention our strengthening partnerships with our charter schools. Uh, this year, we have begun very actively engaging in helping preparation of their crisis response plans, uh, participating in their threat assessment teams on a monthly and ad hoc basis. And we are also available to all of our charters during their monthly active assailant drills. So now is the time in the presentation where we turn to you and uh, we ask for your assistance. 
Uh, as Superintendent Burke identified recently, the state of Florida falls in the bottom as it relates to state funding for education. And your advocacy for safety and security funding for the district will help us make a lot of our recommendations a reality and it will allow us to provide uh, sufficient training to our employees on the procedural enhancements that were identified earlier. So with that, we do ask that you acknowledge and accept our recommendations today and open the floor for any questions. So let me ask the first question. Um, we had a, an email come in, as you all know, from a charter school teacher that said there were guns in the, in the, in the school and student had a gun in the classroom and the teacher brought in guns and I'm confused and I got confusing answers from the district administration what authority that our police department has with respect to going in there and investigating something like that and where the charter school office is involved how does that all work because it's obviously a serious concern to the board if we have unsafe conditions in the charter schools and you all don't have authority to take any action because my understanding is there's a safe school officer for the entire district and that's you Assistant uh, Deputy Chief. So, I mean, do you have authority to go into a charter school when you get a complaint like that and walk in there and, and ask? And if not, we need to tell the legislature, if you're going to put us in charge or responsible for the outcomes in those schools, then you need to make sure that we have the authority to send our police people in there to check out these kind of threats. So where are we on that and what's your understanding? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, they just recently, as of this past year, have given us the authorization that we can, in fact, do enforcement on the campuses, the charter school campuses, as well as the local jurisdictions. So it would still be incumbent upon the charter school administration to make notification that they would need some sort of enforcement assistance. So they do have a safe school officer on their campus for, for the majority of the charter schools. They utilize school security guardians. So they are statutorily covered by their mandates as to who they have to have on the campus for security purposes. But as far as enforcement purposes go in regard to, say, an arrest situation or, or searching and follow up if they found a gun and the investigative part of that, we do have the authority to do it, but we don't typically just go to their campus and randomly insert ourselves into that. It would be something that they would have to collaborate with us and request the assistance on it. Um, similar to like if they had another kind of crime or something on their campus that they needed to report, if they're located in the, in the, uh, the city of Palm Springs or the village of Palm Springs, they may call Palm Springs PD. But at the same time, they could call school police, and we, we would have the same authority level as, as the local jurisdiction. All right, so this off, this, what's this officer called under statute that's in charge? Your title as the person that's in charge of look, over, overseeing all of this. What is that title? The school safety specialist. Okay, and doesn't the school safety specialist... My concern is this board's liability, because you are the school safety specialist. You are employed by this district. And if there's a situation in a charter school, as a school safety specialist, are your hands tied by the charter school doesn't want you in there so you can't look? If, if like this, this, this is a perfect example. I mean, what authority did you have to investigate that email that came in from a teacher saying that there were a student with a gun waving it around the classroom and that a teacher's bringing guns in and they're laying all over the place? I mean, what authority do you have to go in there unless the that board of that charter school allows you to come? What authority do you have? So we do this year, as of July 1st, do have that uh, availability, as Chief Mooney said, to go in and investigate and make arrests where appropriate. As it relates to the particular email that you are referring to, we did some research on the calls for service that we have received at that location and our jurisdictional partners have received at that location for the past two years. Uh, we did not find any uh, substantiation to many of the allegations made in the email, okay. but we're not done researching, uh, and we are going to continue to look into it, dig into it with our charter school partners, uh, because in addition to the uh, criminal elements that were identified, there were some uh, mandatory reporting issues that were identified. So we are also partnered with our um, equity and wellness uh, team, to dig into this some more and provide you with additional feedback. All right, thank you. Other questions, board members? Mrs. Andrews. Just to follow up on the charter school, I, I, I do uh, appreciate you actually uh, 
working with them on their crisis response plans and participating in self-assessment teams and, and also the availability during monthly active uh, assailant drills. But uh, do you all know who the police officers are for the charter school since we do have a charter office that actually works out and observing those charter schools. Yes, they do have a board that's actually the oversight person. So how well are we familiar with what they do uh, with their school police officer as it relates to the charter schools? I mean, I think you probably have this randomly throughout the year, but do you really know, know the offices and we, do we have some kind of specialized relationship with them? We do go out and make site visits to both our charters and public schools, and we uh, engage both our security guards and our school police officers and school resource officers from our jurisdictional partners uh, to understand that they know what their responsibilities are while on our campuses. So that is an ongoing review that we do um, throughout the year. That's great. The, the recent policy that we just discussed this evening with respect to locked doors, does that policy govern the security matters in the charter schools or they're, they're totally does. outside of that? Correct. Okay, I understand. Any other questions? I wanna thank you both. You know, it's, it's, it's obviously security is of utmost concern to the school board and, and you, the two of you have done a phenomenal job with your other officers to make sure that our kids are safe. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we do have a formal uh, recommend, recommended action here. Uh, SP1, I recommend the board accept the school safety and security FSAT finding summary and authorize the district to take action to implement the proposed recommendations. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Discussion? Mrs. McQuinn. I'm not 100% sure that I'm ready to accept all of the recommendations. For example, we didn't discuss the funding. I moved off that page. Um, I have to move back to it. I moved away from it. I think it's on the last page. Do you, would you wait a minute, it should be right up here, or it was up there. <laughs> oh, you can't find it either. <laughs> I was just hesitant as they look for it. I was just hesitant to accept everything. I apologize. Did you find the last uh, the last page when you when it says request legislator yeah. to provide sufficient funding? Right. I'm for really all. comfortable with requests. You know, again, we addressed um, we could add that to our legislative agenda. We've already asked in the past. I don't that anything mandated that they fund. We've already done that. Thank you. Okay, there you go. Um, absolutely acknowledge and accept the, um, you know, the recommendations. The only piece that I would, yes, we should provide funding sufficient for the training of all employees. I just don't know that we are going to define sufficient funding. Well, let me, let me take a shot at that. We, we're enjoying the benefits of the referendum that was passed in 2018 that gave us ample resources to expand our school police force to add security measures such as the Centegix hard panic button. So I'm confident that the budget the board approved and adopted in September will be sufficient. Uh, that funding is contingent on voter approval November 8th to continue it. Uh, I'm very hopeful that the con community will continue to support this. Uh, if they do not, then we're gonna have a different conversation going into the following school year in FY24. Great answer, and I'm totally in support of that. And let me please also add, I recently reviewed our, um, it's in our training, it was required training last year, you know which one I'm speaking about, but it helped me after all of the, um, the state oversight of whether or not we're providing adequate safety measures for our students and employees. So I went through that again, and frankly, I found it, it refreshed what I already knew. So I highly recommend that if anybody wants to just go back and review that again, it's a great idea. Mrs. Andrews? I can't let the chief 
uh, leave, as well as our deputy sitting right there with her. You all look so good. Thank you all for keeping us safe. I mean, I see these two strong police officers keeping us safe, but I want to say thank you to all of your officers. They are awesome. I see them everywhere, and I've truly been everywhere over the last couple of months, but they're doing a great job, I, and I just want you to tell them we love them. Thank Thank them for keeping us safe. They are so happy to take care of our children and our teachers, and they always have a positive disposition about them everywhere they go when I see them, and it's just a pleasure. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Mr. Superintendent, maybe at this point you could point out, the, the, uh, let the board know uh, with respect to the full-time officers and how many we have that want to work and... Um, so uh, recently we negotiated an MOU with PBA that would allow us to offer a 12-month police officer position. And we had initially envisioned 30 12-month positions. Uh, and uh, when Chief Mooney uh, made that available to officers, we had an overwhelmingly positive response. We had about 90 officers that would like to be 12 months. So we're working now with Ms. Frederick through the budget to make that possible. Uh, there is a little bit of a cost that so we're going to be shifting some things around within the school police budget and within the district budget to make that possible. But I think it's great. You know, we've heard for years that we were losing officers to other agencies because the 10 month calendar, while it has its benefits, the drawbacks for people trying to support a family, you know, it's obviously you're making less money when you only work 10 months. So now at 12 months, I believe our officers start, will start just under 60,000, which is very competitive. And uh, chief, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, the only thing I would say is that thank you for the opportunity because it's uh, it, coming in to try to figure out what the needs of the department are. Uh, you know, they're very widespread, and you do have quite a variety of officers working in the department, and, and a lot of them are here for different reasons, um, but all of them are here because they want to be here. Uh, some of them want to be here, but that that salary piece sometimes would lend them to go somewhere else. We have a lot of very experienced people that that um, the, the 10 month versus 12 month isn't really an issue for them. But some of our younger officers that really want to be lifelong employees of the district and school police in particular, this is going to offer them the opportunity to really do a career here and, and get everything out of their job that they that they want while being able to support their family appropriately. So I thank you for giving us the opportunity to to pursue that. Um, and it was something, it's not just I came up with the idea. I, I think there has been some discussion in the past about it, but this having the opportunity to really push it forward and get it approved, I, I think has been a, a, a huge boost to the morale and, and just for the spirit of the support that you guys are showing to this, the school police department. Um, you know, sometimes people talk about, uh, you know, are you supported as a police officer? It, it depends, but you all have shown that you're supporting us, so I appreciate that. Thank you, Chief. As, as Mrs. Andrews said, we're very proud of our police department. I mean, this board voted unanim unanimously to give, the, you know, give the increase, which was the highest of any, any of our employee groups went to the police department. So we know the officers do a great job, and I'm glad we can keep some of the younger guys because I, I hear from the younger guys. They love working here with the kids, but they're trying to support a family, and although they love to be off during the summer with their kids, that doesn't put money in the bank and food on the table. So. I think this will be a great addition. I know we haven't voted on your on your recommendation and the motions on the floor, but we're still under discussion. No, Ms. I just wanted to ask if you would come back again and ask us. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other discussion? All right, all in favor of the superintendent's recommendation and the motion? Say aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Six, six Thank you. That concludes our agenda. All right, we need a motion to go home. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Vice Chairwoman Brill. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. This meeting is adjourned. ...students yet added to our account. Now, there's going to be an option to submit one student and then his or her siblings. You can go ahead and add one sibling at a time. And for purposes of 